Hi, and welcome to the Rejuvenate Podcast. I'm your host, Chrissy Hawks, and I'm here with my co-host, the creator and founder of Feel Younger and Genetic Insights, Elwin Robinson. And today we are continuing the conversation on the Feel Younger Diet. We did a previous episode where Elwin delved into the principles surrounding this. And today we are going to go into more detail about what it means and discussing how one can apply the Feel Younger Diet in order to be as healthy as possible. So Elwin, tell me, why did you want to talk about this today? Yeah, reviewing that episode, I thought it was very good. I do recommend people check it out because it really is a distillation of what I've learned, which is a lot of diet is about working out what is not working for you and cutting that out. And that's the main focus of that episode, and it is very important. However, I know there are still a bunch of people, and I just saw a comment about this today, I think, on YouTube. It's like, oh, God, just tell me what to eat. And, of course, (laughs) um. I do not believe in one universal diet that's good for anyone. I think anyone who is telling you that is either very cynical or very ignorant. Cynical meaning because I know a lot of people want to hear that there's just one right diet for everyone and because it's kind of nice to think that we can all just eat the same, Uh, especially within a family, right? At least all of us in the house can eat the same. Uh, That's a nice idea. And so I can see why people like it. Um, I could see, you know, it's, it's... nice to think of a simple world where everyone is in alignment but the reality is of course that human beings are quite different and i plan to speak a lot about that probably more in the second half of the episode but i thought let's try and get to the point and very quickly get into giving people very specific practical recommendations about what to actually eat beautiful yeah well let's dig into it i mean from the first episode i mean we really food and eating really seems like it should be a simple thing but you know from our previous episode it's really evident um that the type of food you know it's a good if it's only good for you that was what really came across because you could be eating something but if it's causing you stress or dysbiosis or things like that then even though it's considered a health food it's not it's just causing damage yeah it's certainly if your body has an immune response to it like we call allergies or intolerances then it may as well be a poison or an infectious agent because your body's treating it as if it were one. And yeah, these days it is not simple. But I think the kind of person who's listening to watching episodes like this, they know that, you know, fast food is probably not going to be good for them and heavily processed food. And they might still eat it anyway, but at least they know. So we're not really going to give that kind of obvious advice. We're going to go into, we're going to assume that you know the basics about the, the sad, the standard American diet or whatever and how it's not great. And let's go into what you actually can eat. Yeah, I mean, you brought up a really good point about fast food, junk food, highly processed food, because a lot of people may not think that it has, they may know, oh, it's not good for me, but to understand the real detrimental effects of it. Because would you say that that kind of food is really it's bringing us to an early grave? Yeah, in a lot of ways. And it's mainly because of the stuff in it you know partly stuff that is listed on the ingredients label or even these days of restaurants often you can find out what's actually in there if you tell them you have an allergy um but you know a lot of it is also the stuff that's not listed right the uh the heavy metals the pcbs the atrazine the phthalates the you know all of the things that uh, the mycotoxins all the things that we may not think of but which are present and to be honest which can also be present in non-fast food non-processed food uh to some degree and then there's all the things that are present which uh are kind of meant to be there but which also may not be good for you like histamine like oxalates like tyramine like uh, salicylates like uh, phenols like in the form of polyphenols like and uh, like um lectins you know and on and on and on so all of that kind of stuff is potentially a minefield as well but again we we cover that in detail in part yeah. one so i'm um, going into the feel younger diet or any kind of food changer choosing to eat a certain weight in order to really get healthy and choosing what's right for us it may seem to some that it's a difficult choice and it's something that's hard to stick with what do you recommend to people so that they can make a lasting change when it comes to choosing foods that are going to enhance their vitality you've got to find something you enjoy that's the first and foremost and i know you know I have a, like a few different audiences I know who watch this. One of them are kind of like from the Ray Pete School of Thought and, you know, some of his, um, uh, what's the word, students, now teachers, people like Jay and, um, and Hans, who have both been on the uh, show. And I think that's one of the, you know, other people who I know also follow as quite cynical of the diet and kind of make fun of it. And, and I think that's one of the areas 
that's very easy to criticize the pea diet because it's like just eat things that are really tasty that you like like i don't know ice cream or whatever it's it's <laughs> it's kind of like i can see how a cynical person could go or a skeptical person could go hmm you're just telling people what they want to hear and there is obviously some truth to that maybe but there is also some truth to if you enjoy what you eat then it is much more likely to be good for you and there is that you know extensive research around ice cream that confounds the scientists because they don't want to like ice cream um especially because it's full of uh, you know saturated fat and and you know dairy which like even the mainstream these days thinks is bad for you and yet for some reason people have better health outcomes when they uh when they uh, eat ice cream than when they don't and uh, you know there is no as far as i'm aware scientific conclusion about why that is but i you know i guess i think a lot of people make intuitively it's because people enjoy it so much and the value of that enjoyment uh, means something it's absolutely shown to be the case that if you enjoy something um like if you look forward to what you're about to eat on a visceral level not on an intellectual level then you're going to get more uh, amylase in your saliva you're going to get more stomach acids you're going to get more uh, you know, bile movements, you're going to get more peristalsis, you're going to get more ghrelin, um, you know, you're going to get more of all the things that basically tee up the digestive process, I guess that's the point. And so a lot of why think foods are not good for us is because the foods innately are not good for us. They have, you know, all kinds of poisons in, as we talked about, natural and unnatural. But a lot of it also is because we don't digest it correctly, which we've talked about, you know, in great detail in other episodes. So we won't go maybe too much into that here. Uh, but again, if you enjoy it, then that's less likely to happen. So a big tip is you've got to find something that you actually enjoy. And that may not be easy, depending on your genetics, your you know unique unique circumstances or whatever. And sometimes you have to compromise in this regard. Sometimes you might have to go, you know, temporarily. I'm going to have less foods that I enjoy because of X, right? Because of this or that reason. But that shouldn't be like a permanent state. It shouldn't be like a, oh, I want to be healthy and therefore I'm never going to really enjoy another meal again. Or I want to lose weight and therefore I'm never going to truly enjoy another meal again that's not a healthy perspective that is sustainable so you've got to actually enjoy what you eat you've got to find a version and you've got to eat something that leaves you actually satiated and this is really key as well so if what you're eating leaves you feeling i don't know bloated or whatever then that's not what i mean by satiate i don't just mean like i can't eat anymore which i guess is also the case if you have bloating or acid reflux or whatever i mean satiated as in you feel like that that satisfied me i mean very very simply like i have enjoyed that i have had enough i don't want any more i don't need any more i don't feel like having something else now you know, like if you have a savory dinner, a lot of people then crave something sweet. So not that, you know, none of that. Like what I've just had is satiating. And I think if you aim for that, if you aim for, I'm going to enjoy this as much as possible and long term, I am going to enjoy every meal I eat. And then I'm going to make sure I'm satiated by my meals. And if people say, oh, that's not realistic, Owen, or you're trying to lose weight or whatever, it's like, yes, it is. Um, sometimes you have to play some tricks and games in order to accomplish that, admittedly um like for instance you know protein is very associating and so that's why a lot of people when they try to lose weight it's recommended to have a quite a high protein diet because it's so satiating so you know that's one example of something that you probably heard of but a lot of satiation as well is to make sure that you um hit all of the major things that you actually need that's true satiation so you can kind of force satiation by eating a very high protein diet and i'm not saying that's always a bad idea but especially if that means that you're going to have very little or none of something that your body feels like it needs whether that be carbs or whether it be magnesium or vitamin b1 or whatever it is sooner or later your body is going to go um i'm not really satisfied by this it's going to start sending you cravings for something else so making sure that you're genuinely satiated now this sounds like maybe a fancy way of just saying listen to your body and i'm not saying that like listening to your body um and going solely by the prompts and signals that your body's giving you is a luxury of those who are at least reasonably healthy um 
to very healthy. I was going to ask, because like, how can we know if we are actually satiated or if, you know, where those cravings or those things are actually coming from? You know, that seems like... Mm, well, I'm, you know you're satiated because you don't have cravings. Like you eat a meal and then you don't want any more and then you don't feel like anything else until your next meal. Uh, I think it's, you know, really as simple as that. And... Um, now, there's not, not all cravings are bad, right? Like you might be like, oh, I fancy this, I fancy that. And, you know, it's it's something weird. Maybe it's capers, it's, it's sardines or whatever. I don't know. Like, okay, fine. You know, that's that could just be your body telling you that it's missing something. Um, but that, you know, even those cravings, I'd say, were are indications that you are not satiated, that you are missing something. Um, now, t f just for me to go back, you can't trust your body if you are – anything other than, you know, as I say, pretty healthy right. to very healthy. Okay, yeah, um, I think that's kind of where, yeah, where you're going where I was like, well, wait a minute, maybe it, can I really trust myself? It's like, <laughs> no, go for the extra Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, so the problem is, you know, people say listen to your body, your body has this innate wisdom, blah, blah, blah. Well, it's kind of nonsense. Uh, I used to be a drug addict. When I was a drug addict, if I listened to my body and I said, what do you need? It would go, drugs. That's, you know, and you might, oh, that's silly comparison when I'm not a drug addict well you know there's a lot of things that are drugs that aren't really classified other than like stimulants are very common caffeine and you know uh, all the rest and alcohol and cannabis and if we include all that in the drug category uh, actually most of us are but put that aside for a second let's just think about food a lot of foods have um, you know addictive elements added I'm not even talking about the natural ones that some people say are there like in in because you could say almost all foods have a drug like quality in the sense that they raise certain neurotransmitters and hormones and all the rest of it I'm just talking about the drugs that are added extra by the food companies to make their otherwise not very nice food more appealing like you know most famously MSG but there are like many 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 versions of that these days and there are all kinds of other things that they add that make us like enjoy it more than we should do um, so you kind of have to get onto genuine natural foods first before you have any chance of being able to judge that satiation thing accurately to, you know, answer your questions as to which ones we're about to get into that. <laughs> Hold on. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you have to kind of get into real natural foods, uh, in order to be able to judge that. I'd say that's like the other element. Wonderful. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point because obviously, uh, it's quite easy to steam through a bag of potato chips, but most likely very difficult to eat as many baked potatoes. Uh, and just to go back to, yes, and just to go back to that MSG point again, uh, it's in a lot of processed foods. It's hidden. I think if you Google, like, what are all the ways that MSG is allowed to be labeled in foods and look in Google images, you can, like, see charts. There's, like, 30, 50, 80 different names. It could be called vegetable protein or soya protein isolate or like there's so many different words for it that you wouldn't think mean msg that actually mean msg um so you uh, you know quick anecdote i might have told this before but you know when i was a chef um for a specific celebrity chain restaurant um i was submitted into the chef of the year competition and i don't know it's like a few hundred chefs and i ended up making the the finals the top five but i remember one of the reasons is um, I saw a lot of other chefs like put so much effort into things and they would just forget the most basic things, which was basically salt. Like just if you don't add enough salt to food, it doesn't taste of anything. It's kind of that's an elementary, genuine cooking tip for <laughs> anyone watching, by the way. But the other thing was I would use plenty of stock. And when you're in the sauce section, so anything that's kind of, you know, vaguely liquidy, so maybe not on the grill, maybe not like your um, your steaks or your salads or whatever, but anything sauce-ish. Um, the, the, usually, uh, the way it works is you all, you all often have your sauces prepared and you'll put that in the plan. And this is the same for curries, by the way. And, you know, it's not just, uh, the, uh, the one type of cuisine, it's pretty much every type of cuisine, you know, Chinese famously and all the rest of it. So you put your sauce in the pan and then you put some extra water in there so that then when you heat during the process of heating up, some of the steam will come off and it basically ends up the same consistency as it started, but now warm. That's if it's done properly and not in a microwave. And, and so, you know, generally you use stock for that and stock, uh, all stock contains and is 
a lot of MSG. And I didn't know that. So I always use a lot of stock and people I was like, oh, mm, so nice. I love your food, Owen. <laughs> I realized later it's just because I was using more MSG than most people. I had no idea. So basically any restaurant is uh, suspect and obviously uh, fast food chains yes but also your fine dining as I just that was more the example of you know where I was working um, unless they're literally making their stock from scratch which does happen occasionally but you're talking about like top one percent of restaurants there if that um, it, you know it's probably in there any kind of package pre-made anything that they may be using probably has that in so you kind of have to get all of that out does that mean you can't eat out no we'll give you you know we're about to give you guidance on i, I still eat out but I, I can eat out without eat, eating msg again just by eating like simple elemental food rather than complicated processed food yeah that's a really good point they are hiding so much so we think we're doing a good job but they are just so so often getting around getting around things <clears throat> that we and, and that's and I know I said I wasn't going to talk about what to avoid in food with the last episode, but that's just to answer your question about like the satiety thing. You kind of have to quit that in order to get a, a genuine gauge of society. Beautiful. Yeah, so let's get into the um, this next part, which is really previously we discussed uh, genetics and their role in our diet. You know, Can you drill down into each of the macros so that we can understand how to find the best form or percentages for ourselves when it comes to choosing the types of foods that we eat to optimize? Yes. So I think I've noticed a trend of like well, I was part of it, like focusing on nutrient dense. So, you know, like your blueberries are good for you, your broccoli, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, why? Because it has a high level of nutrients, um, micronutrients. So macronutrients are basically the type of nutrients that contain calories or energy. And micronutrients are the type of nutrients that do not contain calories or energy. That's the simple um, explanation to it. And so there was a big trend, and there still is, I think, uh, quite a big trend to focus on micronutrients and so to focus on foods that are high in micronutrients, low in macronutrients. Um, often they're like high in water, high in fiber, high in micronutrients, low in nutrients, like fruits and vegetables, most of them. Um, the challenge with that is your body still needs calories. Now we've talked about this before. Um, is it a good idea to be on a calorie restricted diet? you know the position on this podcast is the answer to that is no. Long term, what it does to you is it slows down your metabolism, which actually makes it more difficult to lose weight, plus it starves every system of your body of the energy that it needs, which long term leads to a lot of chronic health issues and degenerative diseases. So I do not believe that anything, so temporary restriction of calories, fasting for specific purposes, sure, maybe, um, but uh, long term restriction of calories, no. And there are a lot of people, uh, there's a channel that I'm trying to get on here to be interviewed, like Analyze and Optimize. They do a really good job of showing a lot of research that, you know, people 100 years ago, um, they ate, I think, the average of 3,000 calories a day in the US, and no one was obese. No one was overweight. And yeah, they were kind of more active. But remember, the concept of exercise was only invented around the 1960s in California. So 100 years ago, no one was exercising. They were maybe doing more manual labor. Uh, some of them were playing sports, sure, but no one was exercising just for the sake of health. Um, and yet, as I said, no one was, uh, almost no one was obese. So if there's more to obesity than calories. I just saw someone on social media the other day start a big storm about saying that um, all there is to weight loss is eating less calories and moving more. And it is just not true. Uh, the proof that that's just not true, I'll just mention it again, I've said this many times, if someone is hyperthyroid, meaning if their thyroid is overactive, then it is medically like not contested that a person who is hyperthyroid, no matter how much they eat, they will still not be able to gain weight, they will lose weight, they will waste away. So that, so the fact, and people are not, just like with autism or anything else, these things are not binary, they're not black and white, they're on a spectrum. So meaning if you are slow thyroid, you will burn a lot less energy, any calories are much more likely to be put on. It doesn't always work the other way because sometimes if you're slow thyroid, your adrenal glands kick in and then you still don't gain weight. Sometimes if you're slow thyroid, then your digestive system really doesn't work well, then you still don't gain weight. But overall, most people with slow thyroid, maybe 75, 80%, uh, they gain weight. 
Most people with very fast thyroid, they can't gain weight no matter how much they try. So the idea that it's only about calories is nonsense. So anyway, if you want to be on the side that's more fast thyroid than slow thyroid, then restricting your calories is the worst way to go about it. So you need some calories. So then the million dollar question is, okay, I know you love your salads and all the rest of it, but where are you actually getting your calories from? And not answering that question, by the way, is why I saw, and I used to be in the raw vegan world, and people would go between, you know, trying to live off salads and green juice and the rest, and then they'd be binging, whether they break their binge and go and eat McDonald's, or whether they break their, sorry, they break their fast, or almost fast and eat McDonald's, or whether they break their almost fast and, and eat like loads of, um, what was it, like fruit cheesecake with loads of dates and nuts or whatever. But like, you need calories. And <laughs> if you force your body not to have calories, eventually it will break and you'll eat calories and then you'll be like, oh, why did I do that? So rather than doing that, so to, this goes back to your first question, rather than having the binge and purge, like just meet your body's needs for calories and meet it in the best way possible. Okay, so let's go through the calorie sources one at a time. Let's be very, very specific. So let's start with the one that no one disputes that you need some of, which is protein. Absolutely. Okay. Generally, the more muscle mass you have and the more muscle mass you want to gain, the higher percentage of protein you're going to want to eat. Also, the more weight you want to lose, the higher percentage of protein you want to eat. To some degree, there are limits to that. Can you say um, why that is? Yeah, for the reason I just said before, uh, because it's more satiating. So it will stop you overeating. Obviously, despite what I just said about calories, I realize some people are having too many calories, especially those who are obese. And so, you know, it does help to prevent you having too much um, if you make sure you get plenty of protein. Um, so the amount of protein you should be eating. So you mentioned genetics there. Genetics are a factor with protein, definitely. I see some people, and, you know, we have a dietary protein report. Some people, they handle protein very well. Some people, not as much. Now, uh, does that mean that those who don't handle protein well shouldn't eat protein? No. It just means that if you're one of those people who dietary protein, you know, genetically you don't handle it well, you probably don't want to be following one of those diets where you're getting 40% of your calories from protein. That's not likely to work for, me, for you long term. Um, I think most people... I guess there's never any 100% consensus, but most people in the nutritional world would agree that protein is the least clean burning fuel. So um, you need protein, like most of you is made out of proteins other than you know the, the water and uh, the, the bone, but you know most of the uh, uh, other than water, most of you is made out of protein. Um, and then you know fat would be the second place. Um, and so you need protein to replace all of that stuff. But beyond that certain level, which there's a lot of debate and disagreement about what that is, any excess that you're having over replacing what you need to make you um, will be burned as calories. And everyone agrees that um, as a calorie source, it is the least clean burning, It meaning it creates the most toxic residue. Um, there's, there's purines, there's nitrates. Potentially, this can be a stress on the kidneys. Again, this is contested. Some people eat very high protein diets and they say, my kidneys are totally fine and they're not lying. Again, it's just everyone's different. Different people have different genetics, but it's just, it's potentially an issue. So I would say, depending again on your goals and the rest of it, you probably want to have at least 15% of your calories coming from protein and you want to get maybe at most 25 percent 30 maybe coming from protein unless you are unless you know what you're doing if you're like oh l and i do 40 and i feel great great but you probably are already really on top of knowing what's going on with you um and there are potential downsides to that uh that are excessive other than it's not a clean burning fuel um which we won't go into and um, let's just say for general for most people 15 to 30 percent okay um now I'm giving percentages here. I'm being specific because last time I was a bit vague. How do you actually know this? Um, there are all kinds of apps you can use these days. And what you do is you go on and you enter what you've eaten. A lot of the time, if it is something in a packet and it has a barcode, you can scan it and the data will automatically go on there and, and it will kind of fill everything out. And 
Sometimes it isn't very good at knowing all the micronutrients in the food, but it at least will tell you always the level of the free macronutrients. So it'll always tell you how much protein, uh, carbohydrate, and fat are in there. And so you can work out at least using an app like that, definitely what percentage protein, carb, and fat. For sure. Say. And there are a lot of apps out there today. I mean, do you mind show, uh, telling everyone which app you, you've used in the past? I've tried a few. Feel free to share if you remember any, Chrissy. Yeah, I mean, well, I've got the My Fitness Pal app. You know, it used to be just totally free for scanning, but now if you want to scan the barcode, you have to pay a fee. But it's still, it's got, you know, it keeps all your your foods and your logs, and you can create recipes and stuff. It's pretty good. I haven't tried any others, um, but I can't. I think on a previous episode you did mention one or two that you had tried. So yeah, there's lots out there. Get just. Um, try them see what see what works because until you actually are logging it it's like that was a big eye opener for me to go oh actually i need to really up my protein intake i am severely lacking most people underestimate how much their calories are getting from fat because it's so easy to get a lot we'll get into that and then they're probably overestimating how much they're getting from protein and carb that's like the usual thing especially protein unless they are very conscious of it so yeah yeah it's definitely worth doing so all right so that's percentage now what actual food? What actual protein, right? There we and go. This is the million dollar <laughs> question. Yes. Um, so this depends a bit, and I'm going to philosophize more about this probably in the second half of the episode. Maybe if we take too long, we'll do it in a different episode. So uh, I will philosophize with you about what is you know better and worse and right and wrong and all the rest of it later. But for now, let's just be practical. Um, the highest sources of uh, protein food, like ratio to anything else are lean meats and lean fish that's a definite all the plant-based sources if they're natural if they're not like a protein powder or whatever um they come with a significant amount of something else so let's just break it down so there is uh you know red meat beef lamb pork sometimes goes in that category and then whatever the fringe things goat whatever um some cuts have about 25, 20 to 25% protein, and then they have like as much as, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 even, if it, I guess if it's Wagyu, fat. So some of, but some of them have very little. So it could be anything, but the protein level is pretty consistent with red meats. It's about 20 to 25-ish percent protein, and then the fat level can pretty hugely vary. But a lean cut of red meat is mainly protein. Um, when it comes to, you know, chicken, that used to be thought of as a lean meat these days because of the way chickens are raised and all the rest of it. It's not really. Um, and so it's just as easy to get a lean cut of meat from, you know, maybe 5% minced beef or whatever as it is from chicken. Chicken is actually fairly high. And I've got a quick question before we continue. So when you're talking about the different cuts of meat, of course, that there there's different... Um percentages of fats that are in there but how important is it to have grass-fed versus just or, and organic or anything like that with any of these choices that you're going to be talking about yeah I, I, again we covered that in the previous episode uh you want as little poison in there as possible um i mean for me but I'm in a fairly privileged position these days in being able to kind of pick what I want without worrying too much about the price, although I still do think about it. <laughs> Maybe old habits die hard. Um, but I understand a lot of people struggling. So obviously if it's better to get it that way. I would say it's better to, you know, get organic grass-fed minced beef than, uh, you know, normal commercial sirloin steak or whatever. And it will be cheaper that way as well. Um Sometimes organic can be tricky. I, I think if you get it from a local farm that you're happy with um, and the way that they're treated and all the rest of it, then that might be preferable to something that has organic certification, but it's also mass produced for, for a supermarket where a lot of the time they still are, can get away with various different things. Uh, when it comes to ruminants, which is like uh, you know cows, sheep, stuff like that, um, grass eaters, basically, um, what grass fed is a meaningless term. They're all grass fed. The, the distinction is, are they a hundred percent grass fed or sometimes it's also known as grass fed and grass finished. Um, the pro yeah, I mean, it, if they are grass fed, they're going to be higher in uh, vitamin A, 
If they are not, they're going to be higher in uh, Amiga 6s. So take your pick as to uh, which you think is worse, depending on what school of thought you are <laughs> as a listener. Uh, I personally go for grass-fed still, despite being quite a believer in uh, vitamin A being bad. But I know some people are a little bit on the fence about that. Um, or vitamin A in excess being bad, certainly. Let's just say that for now. Um, so... I don't think it's a huge deal so long as it's ethical. Like, I think the more important thing is get it from a farm rather than a supermarket. I was going to say if you can, but we all can. You know, it's just a choice. You don't have to go driving around looking for farms these days. You can just look online and, you know, find somewhere where you're happy with the, the quality of what they do, preferably local, so you can visit. Um, so, all right, so that's the ruminant meat. Uh, lamb is, you know, innately higher in fat usually than beef. It's harder to get lean lamb. Uh, and then there's mutton, which is, you know, obviously grown up sheep, but that's so tough that it's not very popular. It needs to be cooked for many hours. Uh, then, there, you know, there's other niche things, I guess, like uh, venison and elk are very lean. Um, so meaning, you know, rarely high fat. Uh, then the other types of meat. So we got chicken uh, and pork and, you know, I, I'll put poultry, I guess, poultry and pork. Um, so poultry and pork are more problematic for a few different reasons. Uh, number one, they are higher omega-6s. This is uh, unquestioned. Uh, number two, I, and I realize this is a, a judgment, but anything that if you accidentally eat a, any of it raw could make you sick, I'm not as much of a fan of, personally. I just don't think that makes sense. Um, now, you could say that's silly, Owen. If you cook it thoroughly, it's not a problem. Okay. Fair enough, if you feel that way, I just don't feel that way. I feel like, um, you know, if something is so dirty that it's probably going to poison you if you accidentally don't cook it thoroughly, that's something that's not at the top of my list, personally. Uh, given that there's really no benefit of it over ruminant meat as that I'm aware of, the only arguments I've seen about it being beneficial are maybe like energetic, you know, like in, um, you know, Eastern systems that it has a different energy that's better for this organ or that organ or something. But, you know, the old thing about why it used to be better is because it's lower in cholesterol. But uh, since, you know, we found out that the level of cholesterol in food barely affects the level of cholesterol in the blood and high cholesterol in the blood is not necessarily bad anyway. And then the other thing was, um, you know, obviously that poultry is white meat. is supposed to be leaner, but that's not true either these days with the way that uh, animals are fed. So I don't see any benefit of it, except for, of course, again, go back to our original point, if you enjoy it much more <laughs> and then... You know, that's up to you. That's fair enough. All right, so that's animals. Um, now let's go to fish. So uh, there is a problem with fish which needs to be addressed, which is they are all full of poison. Now... Referring to the, to the leads, or leads, mercury, you know, think toxic metals. So people will say, well, you know, isn't that true for the other animals that you just mentioned? And uh, yeah, it's true. Like that they will have some poisons as well but it's just been documented that seafoods these days are significantly higher with you know with land animals that all animals do tend to accumulate poisons because they accumulate what is in plants both the nutrients and the poisons uh you know i think like cows and, and you know sheep are it's fairly low uh, but the certain places of the animal it's still pretty high like so animals accumulate poisons in the bones um, animals accumulate poisons in some of the organs, you know, especially liver, kidney. Um, and so we want to be careful with those kind of things. But certainly like muscle meat, probably connective t t tissue meat, uh, stuff like that. It's, it's pretty low as poison sources go. Fish, it's pretty high. So some people just are more adapted like evolutionary genetically to uh, eating fish. I, unfortunately, we don't have a report on that. Um, we have kind of clues towards that, which I'll go through later. Uh, but uh, yeah, I would say if you're someone who is more naturally, what's the word, a fish eater, then the safest thing to do is to go for the smallest fish. That's generally what's shown, and the non-carnivorous fish. So I said animals will tend to accumulate both nutrition and poisons because, you know, a cow, for instance, is eating a lot of grass or whatever. Um, so a, you know, a tuna, like a carnivorous fish, a fish that's eating other fish is going to accumulate more poisons than a fish that is only eating plants. So, you know, like your sardines or your anchovies, stuff like that is going to be uh, much safer. And shellfish, you know, they have a lot of nutrients in them, but they do generally have a lot of toxins as well. So 
that's kind of up to you if you want to go down that road or not. Uh, okay, so next for protein. And so, yeah, sorry, with fish, it's kind of the same thing. There are some very lean fish where it's, you know, the vast majority of the calories coming from protein. And then there are some fatty fish where a lot of it comes from uh, fat as well. So all the animal proteins so far that we talked about, it's protein and there may or may not be a lot of fat with it. That's what we've got so far to work with. And then we've got dairy. So if we're talking about actual milk, whether from, you know, a cow, a, sh a sheep, whatever, um, that's got a very broad spread of all nutrients, which I guess makes sense as it's got to exclusively nurture a young whatever into, uh, you know, semi-adulthood. So it's got a decent amount of protein, a decent amount of carbohydrates, and a decent amount of fat. Depending on the animal, we're talking about in terms of calorie sources, probably, you know, 20 ish percent of calories coming from protein 20 ish coming from carbs and 60 ish coming from fat although that does vary quite widely depending on the animal but i think you know cow dairy is something like that maybe 25 25 50. um now obviously all kinds of things are made from dairy and so you know your cheese for instance that's basically where the carbs are and some of the protein but mainly the carbs are removed so with your cheese, you're talking about maybe, again, like with meat, about 20 to 25% comes from protein. But like a very fatty cut of meat, you are talking about like 40 to 50% of the cheese is fat. So you're getting a lot of fat with your protein again, if you're getting it from cheese. Uh, yogurt, yogurt is, uh, you know, just kind of a version of dairy that has a bit less carbs, but otherwise it has the same kind of profile. Um, and then, of course, with butter and cream, that's where the protein and the carbs are removed and we're just left to the fats. So that's not really relevant to the protein conversation. All right, then we're talking about vegetable proteins. So there's a couple of different sources. Again, uh, as with the animal foods, there's you know potentially other nutrients coming in. But the difference is with vegetable sources, unless they are heavily refined, there's always other significant sources of calories. Whereas with protein, we've talked about uh, at least not in the case of dairy, very easily, unless you're talking about, again, like a protein powder. But in the case of you can get a, you can get a very lean meat that's mainly protein, you can get a very lean fish that's mainly protein, you can't really get a very lean vegetable source of protein. So um, the pro significant protein comes in beans. Sometimes like the most you'll probably get in a bean is like a ratio of 40% to 60% calories protein, something like that. So 40% calories, protein, 60% carbs, like some beans. Sometimes it's way more in the other direction. It's like 20% protein, 80% beans. But like that's the best you're going to do if you're looking to get high protein from a bean source. Um, exception to that, I guess, would be soybeans. And soybeans are more like a nut in their macronutrients. They are maybe, again, 25%-ish protein, maybe 50% fat. So they're more high fat again. Then there's nuts and seeds that also have high protein anything from 10 to 30% protein. Uh, seeds tend to be higher, um, like hemp seeds, I think is some of the highest. But again, you're talking about 50% um, of the weight of the thing is fat. So you're getting a lot of fat with it. There's, there's nothing where you're not getting twice as much fat as protein, I believe. Um, and that's in terms of the grams. In terms of calories, I think you're, you're really lucky to get like more than 20% of total calories come from protein with nuts and seeds. It's usually like 80% fat. So you have to be aware of that if you're trying to reduce the fat or maybe you don't want fat from nuts and seeds. But anyway, it's a different story. Um, what other significant sources of protein are there in the plant world? Grains is another one. Um, some grains, especially like wheat would be an example, is very high in protein. Some grains like rice is very, very low in protein. So grains, it's kind of anything from one or two grams per hundred grams to 25-ish grams, again, with like your higher sources like wheat, spelt, uh, rye, those kind of sources. Um, oats are lower, but still high-ish. I can't remember off the top of my head, 15, I think, something like that. But So grains are another source, but again, grains are way more carbs than they are protein. Um, like way more. <laughs> Uh, much more so than beans. So beans are a better source of protein than grains in most cases. Some people talk about some grains being a good source, like quinoa, famously, they say it's a good source because it has all the essential amino acids, which we haven't gone to that yet, I know. Um, but it's still like, I think a ratio of four to one or five to one 
carbs to protein. So it's still right. way more Right, more significantly carbs. carbs, yeah. Yeah. And that's really it. Now, yes, there is a bit of protein in, you know, green vegetables or whatever, um, but there's so little in the relation to, like, water and fiber weight that it's not really going to satiate you on its own. So that's why I'm not really focusing on that so, that so much. So those are really your protein sources. Um, the only other exception, of course, is refined proteins. So um, that would be your protein powders. So these days, there's quite a gamut to choose from. When you and I were youngsters, Chrissy, there was probably just like whey protein, egg protein, that may be in it. don't know if you ever came across that in your youth, um, but that's pretty much all I saw. Uh, uh, you know, and I guess cassian, like just milk protein. These days you can get dairy protein from cows, sheep, goats, uh, maybe even camels. Plants. <laughs> there are veg there are vegan um, protein powders out there. Well, yeah, I'm going to get to that. So I was just doing dairy first. So there's numerous animals that you can get dairy from. Then you can actually get meat source proteins, which didn't used to exist when I was young. So um, collagen peptides, for instance, are very popular these days. They, they can be both... Uh, I've seen beef sourced, I've seen chicken sourced, I've seen fish or marine sourced uh, collagen peptides. So collagen proteins have a very specific amino acid profile, which means they're certainly not a complete protein. They're more like the type of protein that supports, uh, you know, skin health, connective tissue health, and also like a neurochemical health, I would say to some degree, like a lot of the um, amino acids in collagen are calming and relaxing neuropeptides and you know often used for gut health as well so i some people don't count them towards protein intake if you use those things i do but i i realize it's in a kind of uh, its own category in a way i wouldn't rely on it certainly exclusively for protein or you will end up deficient in some of the amino acids um then we've got other animal proteins i've seen beef you know normal beef not collagen protein um i'm sure other animals exist but i personally haven't seen them and i have definitely seen other fish protein then as you said chrissy there's a big plant-based protein and this of course makes sense because it is more difficult as we talked about to get exclusively protein from plants um now having said that it's actually not that easy even among plant proteins uh it, it absolutely is done um so there is like rice protein isolate uh, pea protein isolate, soya protein isolate has been around for quite a while. But a lot of so-called plant protein powders still have actually quite a lot of other macros in. And one that I'm thinking of, that's, this is almost always the case for, for instance, hemp protein. If you look at hemp protein, it actually has loads of fiber in there. Um, and it usually has quite a bit of uh, like fat and some carbs as well. So it's not a very re you know refined protein after all. I think it is basically just the stuff left over when they make hemp seed oil, um, which probably they used to throw away at some point. Now they sell it as a protein powder, but it's not really a protein powder. It still has loads of other stuff in it. Uh, but you can obviously get a plant protein powder. With all the refined protein powders, you've got to remember it is a processed food. So what well, that means is, first of all, it's not natural, whatever that means, whether that's important to you. Second of all, in the process of extracting that protein, it's been through a lot of industrial processes and it is indeterminate what level of contamination of what is in there. One of the other problematic things, not always, but often, is um, knowing the quality of what you started with, you know? So yes, you can buy 100% grass-fed, um, you know, whey protein or beef protein and you can buy, you know, 100% organic rice protein or whatever, but you have to look for that. You, you certainly can't uh, expect that that would be the case. So, all right, those are all different protein sources. What do I actually recommend? What I recommend is this. If um, land animal agrees with you, I'm not going to be what's the word, um, iconoclastic here, I'm going to agree with almost everyone that beef or, you know, maybe bison, a version of beef, is probably your healthiest and best option. Uh, if you like, you know, venison, elk, something like that, as another very lean source, great, go for it. But it actually doesn't have to be lean, to my mind, depending on your fat needs, and we'll talk about that when we get to fat. That's probably your best. I don't see, again, a massive reason for going for chicken or pork. Yeah, you know, pork is higher in, you know, vitamin B1. I mean, there's there's always some small reasons, but overall, 
I don't see any significant reasons to go for those, given the drawbacks. There are other drawbacks as well. Um, but yeah, I won't get into those. So uh, dairy, if you're into dairy, um, if you can handle lactose uh, and carbs, then milk is a perfectly reasonable option. If cow milk doesn't agree with you, then you know sheep or goat might. Uh, yogurt, if you like things fermented by lactic acid bacteria, is a very good option as well. That'll tend to have a bit less carbs. Uh, sometimes they do low fat yogurt, so you can also reduce the fat if you want. And that's a very decent protein source, as is uh, kefir or kefir, depending on how you say it. Um, those kind of fermented dairy. Um, if you do not have a problem with fat, large amounts of saturated fat, then cheese may be another option. And again, if cow doesn't agree with you, then, then goat or sheep might well. And if animal protein does not agree with you and or you're against it, then um, I would say that going for the healthiest versions of um, beans and or grains and or nuts and seeds would be important. Now, when I say healthiest versions, what do I mean? First of all, um, obviously organic is going to be better. But second of all, I'm more talking about the way it's being processed, not in the bad sense, but in the good sense. So plants, because not, nothing wants to be eaten. Animals primary strategy for preventing that is to run away or fight back. The plants primary strategy for that is to build up poisons inside themselves to stop you eating them or stop you eating them excessively, um, especially their seeds, which they prize very highly. So if you're going to eat them, which I'm not against, and I do, but then you've got to be aware of that and you've got to be doing something to reduce the anti-nutrients in those things. So, you know, a simple version that involves you doing no work might be eating sourdough bread instead of bread. In an ideal world, you'd meet all of your nutritional needs in the form of vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, and more from the foods you eat. However, unless you prepare all of your food at home from scratch using the highest quality ingredients possible, the reality is that most of us need some nutritional support. Most of us need to take supplements if we want to look, feel, and perform at our best on a consistent daily basis. And this is especially true if you have genes that give you an elevated need of certain nutrients. And this is where Feel Younger can help. What I love about Feel Younger is that they offer a huge range of quality supplements and healthcare products formulated and endorsed by Owen Robinson, including must-haves like magnesium glycinate and vitamins B12, D3, and K2. And they do it at affordable prices with free shipping for orders over $50 without ever compromising on quality, purity, or potency. To learn more about how Feel Younger supplements can give your health a boost while supporting this podcast, please visit feelyounger.net and use promo code rejuvenate to get 20% off your first order. That's promo code rejuvenate for 20% off your first order at feelyounger.net. And can you just explain um, sourdough and why it's more beneficial over just regular bread? Yeah, so... The difference with sourdough is there's no yeast added. It uses whatever yeast are in the environment. But the main practical difference from my point of view is that the fermation, uh, fermentation process lasts a lot longer. It might be a day rather than an hour or two. And what that means is that a lot of the more difficult to digest elements of the grain are broken down by the fermentation process, which then can make it easier for digest for a lot of people. It's also the traditional way bread was made for a long time. There was like, since we've had bread to, since we stopped having sourdough bread is like this long and then like non-sourdough bread is this long. <laughs> so again, it's just, it's just the normal way of eating <laughs> bread. Um, and there's different versions of that, you know, like I, I quite like Ethiopian food and they have their, um, injera made with teff and it's the same thing they like ferment it for several days to like break down the anti-nutrients in and there's versions of that in cultures really throughout the world you know famously i think um you know the early christians two thousand years ago were doing it with wheat bread and the, the ezekiel bread and all that kind of stuff so this is like almost every culture has known this and of course western price documented quite nicely this in his book um so the grain has got to be processed and fermenting is definitely one way of doing it sprouting is another way of doing that kind of both would be a good way of doing that and making it much more uh, good for you. Um, with beans, fermenting doesn't really work because it makes them all hard, even once they're cooked, but sprouting definitely does work. Um, and well, the beans can be fermented, but then it's kind of for something else. But like in terms of then eating them afterwards, it doesn't work. So anyway, uh, with 
with uh, legumes, the main thing is soaking, pouring away the water and then uh, sprouting, and then also cooking thoroughly. Ideally, if you're going to have beans, I would pressure cook them. You know, Dr. Gundry talks about this. It breaks down a significant amount of the lectins if you do it that way. If you're not going to heavily ferment and sprout and all the rest of it grains, pressure cooking is also a good idea. Like in the case of, you know, if you're just going to eat white rice or something like that, it will break down more of the anti-nutrients. With nuts and seeds, in most cases, I would say ideally avoid because of the high level of unsaturated fat content, which... I realize it's not quite mainstream yet how that's not a good idea, but it's just not a good idea. Um, if you really want to get your protein from that source, I would actually probably recommend a protein powder. I think there is such a thing. I know there's such a thing as hemp protein. I think there's sunflower protein, almond protein powder maybe. you know, Maybe that might be a better option because at least you're not having that high amount of unsaturated fat. couple of exceptions. People say seed oils are bad. There are two seeds that are so low in unsaturated fats, they're actually lower in unsaturated fats that everyone who recommends not to eat seed oil does recommend. Um, and that is coconut and especially macadamia nut. They are extremely low in unsaturated fats. So those are fine. However, uh, ironically, we're talking right now about protein, neither of them are significant sources of protein. So they're not really going to help with that. Um, so with protein, all right, let's break it down for a second. B Taking all of that in, all of what I just said, what's the easiest thing? Well, this is why I said it depends. This goes back to the Feel Younger Diet Part 1. It depends what agrees with you. Um, probably the simplest thing overall is probably, as a lot of people who've been on this show also recommend, beef. But, oh, sorry, I missed one. Eggs. Let's just talk about eggs for a second. Um, so eggs, yeah, they're in their own category. That's why I forgot them until now. Um Egg whites are very high in protein, and that protein is pretty easy to digest. Um, raw egg whites used to be popular among a certain class of people. Um, they do like stop biotin absorption, which is an important B vitamin. So if you have a lot of them, you should definitely supplement with biotin. Um, and then, you know, back in the 80s when I was young, there was the whole salmonella scare, and people these days are afraid of raw eggs. So cooking is probably the safest. Um, egg. Whites are very high in protein and are a decent source. If they agree with you, I can't see any problem having them. And when I say that, I mean if your immune system doesn't react to them. But otherwise, yeah, they're also in a good category. So beef is one example. Um, eggs, certainly egg whites. Egg yolks may be a more problematic. I'll talk about them when I talk about fat. Um, beef is a good option. Egg whites are a good option if you can tolerate them. Milk is a good option, and or any fermented milk product, yogurt, etc. if you can tolerate it, if you don't have an issue with it. If, like me, you actually do well with a lot of fat and saturated fat, even cheese might be an option. Um, it, otherwise, I do have plant sources of protein as well. Um, otherwise, I personally quite like fermented grains. Um, so I will have like a sourdough bread uh, made with non-wheat flour. Um, but any version of that, if, you, if you're happy with wheat flour, any kind of sourdough bread or any kind of other sourdough concoction, whether it's an injera or anything else I haven't heard of, also good. Any kind of <laughs> fermented grain product that you like, like go for it. Um, beans, because they don't like do well with fermentation, the best you can probably do is soak them heavily and sprout them and, and cook them to death in a pressure cooker. Um, would not be the top of my list as a protein source, but for some people, they do great. And so if so, I would, um, even though I'm not against carbs, and we'll talk about them next, I would I would recommend if you're going to eat beans to get the ones that are fairly high in protein, like I think like your black beans or your aduki beans or something like that, where it's like a two to one ratio of protein, well, one to two ratio of protein to carbs. So you're getting a decent amount of protein from them. Uh, so beans, if they agree with you, fair enough. And nuts and seeds as a source of protein, I just wouldn't do for the reasons I said earlier. So um, that's basically it. Oh, and fish, I would also not do because of the level of toxins in them. If they really agree, so if they're really the best source for you because all the others are not good for you, then fair enough, then the smaller ones. So we're talking about beef, eggs, if they agree with you, dairy, if they agree with you, fit, uh, um Grains, if they agree with you, <laughs> and then 
Uh, fish is a running theme. If nothing else agrees with you, <laughs> and/or you feel like it's really beneficial for you, but then try and not have like the sushi fish that's carnivorous. Try and have the the small fish, your anchovies and your sardines and stuff. Going into where you're saying, you know, if it agrees with you, what are the telltale signs to know if it doesn't agree with you? Um, well, we can start with not having the things that we talked about earlier, so the enjoying it and satiation. Um, but then, yeah, I mean, it's. That's a hard question to answer simply. I think we do talk about it in part one and, you know, we talked about it in the digestive issue, but any kind of digestive symptoms are obvious examples of it not agreeing with you, but it certainly should be limited to that. Right. It could be yeah. fatigue. It could be allergy flare up. It could be... Bloating, it, gases, things well, like that. Well, they're all digestive symptoms, but you right, know, I'm yeah, talking about yeah, other stuff. It yeah. could be joint okay. pain. It could be a headache. It could be depression. Like, uh, unfortunately, because... An immune response can affect you in so many different ways. Um, that's kind of hard to say. As I said, we cover that in other episodes. I don't want to go into that too much. Um, let's assume that the people know what that means. If you don't know what that means, it is a good point. <laughs> you need to check check out our episode on uh, allergies and intolerances. I think we go through in detail there. Absolutely. Okay, yes. So do you, are you ready to move on to carbs? Yeah. Beautiful. Then, yeah, let's kick it off here then. Okay, so carbohydrates, the recently much um, demonized macronutrient. So two, three decades ago, the really demonized macronutrient was fat, right? Everyone thought fat makes you fat, fat is bad, saturated fat is bad. Uh, these days, it's all about anti-carbs. A lot of people are into ketogenic diet and all the rest of it. Obviously, people we've had on here are either pro-carbs or maybe neutral to carbs. I don't think we've personally had any anti-carb people on yet, but I know it's pretty big in the um, in the ecosystem there of uh, health advisors. So are carbohydrates a good idea? I think like we have covered this extensively in other videos. Um, so let's just sum up what we have learned. As always, first of all, it depends on the person. So it's one of our most popular reports in Genetic Insights is the Carbohydrate Report. That's geneticinsights.co, by the way, because I still see YouTube comments saying, what are you talking about? Geneticinsights.co uh, slash blood sugar maybe or something for the Carbohydrate Report. I can't remember. Chrissy will put the link in the notes. But, um, but uh, so what we've seen in, the, in even the genetics, and there's more to it than only the genetics. It's just the starting place. There are some people who have more of a farmer DNA, some people have more of a hunter-gatherer DNA, and some people are in between. What does that mean? As far as we know, according to mainstream history, about 30,000 years ago, some of our ancestors started doing agriculture. You know, if we go back to Garden of Eden, you know, biblical law, then it's, you know, it was um, Cain and Abel, right? That was the first example of agriculture. But it was quite a while ago, let's put it that way, whether you want to believe science or religion or whatever, it was quite a while ago. We've been doing it for quite a while. But we haven't been doing it forever. And so my understanding to go back more to science is that, and I think this is quite controversial, but my understanding, and I believe this is mainstream science, is that our earlier ancestors probably were largely vegetarians, which is, or, or whatever, like, more, not vegetarians maybe, but more plant eaters, let's put it that way, which is why we still have the appendix, which is like the leftover cecum. So animals that are more plant eaters, herbivores, they have much larger large intestines, so they have this um, this pocket in the large intestine called the cecum, uh, and we kind of have a shriveled up version of that. So that indicates that at some point we were largely primarily plant eaters. Then for whatever reason, cataclysm or whatever we had to shift and we ended up being primarily more animal eaters and there's plenty of evidence for that as well and one of them is how acidic our stomach is so there's evidence in our digestive tract of us being plant eaters there's evidence of our digestive tract of us being animal eaters then again maybe 30-ish thousand years ago we stopped being more hunter-gatherers so we were herbivores then we were more carnivores hunter-gatherers then we moved on to agrarian. So we got used to, oh, we can actually just stay in one place, grow our own food. Awesome. And I'm pretty sure that growing crops came before animals um, en masse anyway. And uh, like I think even ancient Egypt, there's evidence there, for instance, that, you know, they're eating like primarily grains and stuff. So 
but you know, different places in the world, according to fossil records, you know, the, some of our ancestors are eating this, some of them are eating that. Okay, so some people are more adapted to eating um, more grains, more simple refined carbohydrate, you know, starches, which starches break down into simple glucose. They're often quite high glycemic. Um, some of us are not. There are hunter-gatherers still existing right now on this earth, despite, you know, the exploitation of every inch of this planet by those who can get away with it. And so imagine, for at most, like, there must have been a percentage of us that were hunter-gatherers up until recently, like a lot of us, right? So some of us have had a chance genetically to adapt to a lot of carbohydrates, and some of us have not. It's as simple as that. And so, as I said, in Genetic Insights, we help you work out which of those things, uh, which of those categories you belong in. Now, that's not the only factor. You might be someone who is genetically predisposed to be fine with carbohydrates, but for all kinds of other factors, you may still have insulin resistance and be well on the route to diabetes. Um, there may be reasons for that which are non, not related to having excess carbs that people like Jay Feldman, who we had on recently, will you know, have talked about in detail. Um, but, you know, let's just say that's still controversial. Um, on the other hand, you may have a, you may have a report saying that you have a hunter gatherer DNA, but maybe you benefit more from carbohydrates. It's just probably you're not going to do great with a lot of simple carbohydrates. Probably if you listen to people say, ah, oh, you can just eat sugar and you can just eat white rice and baked potato and you'll be fine. That probably won't work for you eventually because, um, because you're not genetically adapted to it, but you may feel better on it for a while. So, um, you know, one obvious reason why carbs may not agree with you, despite whatever genetics you have, is because of the organisms inside your gut. So different organisms um, eat different things. The simple answer is to say that the bacteria inside you eat soluble fiber, and that's it. But the truth is, you know, you have more than just bacteria. There's often fungi to one degree or another, candida famously, uh, which is technically yeast. And then there's other stuff as well. And so the organisms in you, they, some, they eat some amino acids, they eat some other constituents of plants like poly, uh, polyphenols, for instance. Um, they eat all different types of carbohydrates other than fibers. Famously, you know, the FODMAPs from um, RBS. So, you know, fructose, oligosaccharides, disaccharides. Um, I can't remember what the rest of it stands for, polysaccharides, whatever. So, like, and what are those? All right, so let's explain this a little bit. A, a very simple, the, the most simple form of carb is glucose. So glucose is just um, a the most readily instantly available type of carbohydrate that your body will immediately be able to turn into energy. Um, every other type of carb you consume, your body will sooner or later eventually probably turn into glucose. I say probably because sometimes it gets stored as fat and other stuff, but if it's going to turn into a type of carbohydrate for your body to use, it's going to be glucose. Some things that, so there are some things called starches. Starches are long chains of simple glucoses. And so, especially when they're cooked, this is why baked potato famously has a higher glycemic index or a stronger impact on your blood sugar than sugar, because sugar is not uh, just simple glucose, and so it actually takes longer for your body to break it down. So glucose is the most simple. Um, starch is just a long chain of glucose. Then there's other things. Fructose would be another example. So fructose is a different molecule um, that your body cannot deal with as easily. It has to go through a process in the liver. It cannot be, just be absorbed straight away through the stomach or the intestines and, and go straight into the bloodstream. It has to go and be processed via the liver. Do we know why that is? Uh, why God made it that way? Or... <laughs> I can't. Well, yeah. <laughs> Trying to know or understand the mind of the designer of this <laughs> this thing. Yeah, it's interesting because I didn't really know that about that fructose just is for, goes through the liver first pass, but the glucose is, is processed a different way. I had no idea because there's a lot of people that, you know, I remember I was watching this one channel. It was all about fruitarianism, things like that, and I had no idea about it and starting to eat more um, more fruit. Not that I under um, had any adverse reactions in that regard, but I just didn't realize. So if somebody's got some liver issues, having such a high fructose diet could be not very helpful. 
Yeah, I, I think the way you said that tactfully is actually very accurate. So it's not to say that fructose is necessarily a bad idea. Obviously, as you say, fruit, fruitarians are a big fan of it. Uh, Ray Pete, who we talk about a lot on the channel, he was a big fan of it. So the arguments for and against it are actually similar. So the people who say it's good are like, because it has to go through the liver, it doesn't get dumped into the bloodstream as quickly. It doesn't create such a strong insulin response. This is the simple version. I realize some people are going to tell me off because it's more complicated but that's the simple answer um but the people who have something against it have the same thing it's got to go through the liver your liver is already overloaded <laughs> probably to some degree or another um and so yeah this is the thing where almost everyone agrees high fructose corn syrup for instance like it, it, there's something magically bad about high fructose corn syrup other than the fact that it's just a lot of fructose why is that so you know desirable for, for the food industry? So very simply, fructose is a lot sweeter than glucose. So glucose has a stronger impact on the blood sugar. Uh, it's much more easily absorbed. Therefore, it has a much stronger impact on the blood sugar. It's going to create a more strong insulin response. But um, it's, uh, uh, yeah, and that's because it's uh, more easily absorbed. Uh, whereas fructose is not, but it is more of a strain to the liver. And so that's really the, the, the only thing that's bad about high fructose corn syrup, as far as I'm aware, is just simply because of the degree of that it taxes the liver. And so people say that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and stuff like that, some people say that is caused by that unnatural excess of fructose. But yeah, it's desirable to have more fructose from a food industry point of view, because it's sweeter. It's just more enjoyable. It seems to be easier to overeat fructose um, as well. Because it doesn't go straight into the blood sugar, um, it you know it takes longer to, to end up in the blood. So therefore, it's easier to overdo it um, before you realize that you have had enough. That's my understanding of it. Um, so different organisms inside you might you know, some might prefer starches, some might prefer fructose. So those are both pretty simple. If you take one molecule of glucose and one molecule of fructose and bind them together, that's called sucrose. So table sugar, your white sugar, that's supposed to be so terrible, all it is is just a molecule of fructose and just a molecule of uh, um, glucose. If we're talking about honey, if we're talking about maple syrup, if we're talking about agave syrup, if we're talking about coconut sugar, all of these different things, they are only ratios of glucose to fructose plus maybe some other stuff <laughs> so you know, obviously maple syrup's got some water in there and you know uh, honey and maple syrup have got a bit of nutrition in there as well other nutrients you know uh, molasses has other nutrients but you know fundamentally that's the big what's the word determiner and so generally if you're wondering how much fructose it has to glucose is a simple way to tell if it tells you the glycemic index so the glycemic index, for instance, of um, like coconut sugar is lower than normal sugar, which is why it's sold as being beneficial. But the only reason that it's lower is because it has more fructose to glucose. So, you know, is that really better? Uh, again, it depends on your opinion of fructose as to whether that's better or not. But that's the only reason that it would have a low glycemic index, just to explain that. Um, all right. So we just talked, we started talking about a lot of refined sugar. And then there are more complicated molecules of sugar. Um, and so you know, there's a disaccharide, so sucrose is an example of a disaccharide, di just means two. Um, and then there's um, much more complicated versions, like an oligosaccharide, where it's a lot of different molecules bound together. And then it gets to a certain point, and there's polysaccharides, which poly stands for many. And it gets to a point where there's so many sugars bound together, your body can't break it down. And that's called fiber. <laughs> and if it can be broken down by bacteria and if it swells up with water i guess that's the other element of it then that's called soluble fiber and if it cannot be broken down by bacteria either then that's called insoluble fiber so that's all it is so cellulose if you heard of that that's still just carbohydrate it's still carbs it's just a form of carbs that your body's not able to uh, break down and digest. So I realize it's really, what's the word, basic, but I just want to explain the basics of it. I know we talked about proteins a lot, like different amino acids in other episodes, which is why I skipped over that a little bit more. But again, I promised to get practical, so let's get practical. All right, so we talked about the simple types of sugar first. I explained how, if you want to have a refined sugar, how to judge it, right? Probably better to have it with more 
um, what's the word, micronutrients. So I pr probably prefer like a, a molasses or a maple syrup or a honey over like a white sugar because it has more micronutrients in most cases. But, you know, other than that, it's only down to the ratio of fructose to glucose. I personally don't like a lot of fructose, so I would avoid agave, coconut sugar, most honey, especially runny honeys. The, the honey that crystallizes tends to be higher glucose, um, personally, because they have that higher percentage of fructose. All right, so that's the refined sugars. Let's talk about where we probably want to be getting our carbs from. So, but I, I want to do the other stuff first because it will it'll make a lot of this it's clear because then then as well there's an understanding we their definitions have been defined in you know then that also is just it just makes things clear so thank you thank you yeah and then the more so it, again just to elaborate on this the more complicated the molecule the the, the the more like it's a web of different molecules of sugar bound together as opposed to a simple string like in the case of starch the more complicated the longer it takes for your body to break down meaning the slower it will raise your blood sugar that's the other thing to understand. I'm not sure if I fully clarified. Um, so very simple molecules on their own, like glucose powder, or a very simple chain of glucose bound together, like a simple starch. Um, that's going to raise blood sugar quite a lot. If it's a very, very complicated you know, um, uh, compound, then that's going to be broken down much more slowly. So if we're talking about um, simple sugar, we're talking about starch. If we're talking about... Um, probably more fructose, we're talking about fruit. And then if we're talking about um, the more complex, then we're talking about vegetables. That's the simple way to break it down. So starch would be uh, grains, beans, and root vegetables. Um, fructose would be more fruits. And then um, the more complicated molecules of carbs would be Def, more, primarily vegetables and also there's some in fruits, like there's, you know, mannose and you know, different things in, in fruits as well. So when they say vegetables are the best form of carbs, the reason why they're saying that is because they're the most complex forms of carbohydrates, so they're the least likely to spike blood sugar. Okay. The problem is most vegetables, other than the starchy vegetables, are also a very minimal source of carbs. So... You know, you're talking about your broccoli, your cauliflower, your green beans, I don't know, whatever your non starchy vegetables are, basically your non-root vegetables, um, none of them are going to have significant amount of carbs. So when I see a lot of these diets, like, a, I don't know, an anti-candida diet or whatever, it's like, yeah, don't have sugars, obviously, and no fruit and no this, and, uh, like, oh, but you're allowed non starchy vegetables. Well, there's hardly any carbs in non starchy vegetables. That's not a significant source. That's not really going to cut it long term. It may be necessary to restrict them temporarily for whatever, you know, specific protocol you're on, but, uh, you know, long term, you're going to need to get your carbs from somewhere. And I would say where to get your carbs from is the by far the hardest choice or the hardest thing to resolve and address for most people. Most people have some degree of lack of gut health that we talked about before in the digestive issue. Um, proteins can be a channel, challenge as well in a different way. All right, so let me explain this. Proteins are a challenge because it's primarily proteins that your immune system reacts to. So most allergens are proteins. Even if you think about you know pollen and cat hair and all the rest of it, it's actually when you really get down to it, it's always the protein. And so it's the same for... You know, foods as well. If you react to a food, it's almost certainly, not always, but usually the protein in the food that you have the allergy or intolerance to. So that's more the issue of proteins. It's finding the one that your immune system doesn't react to. And that's why I said beef is good, eggs if they agree with you, um, you know, dairy if, they, if it agrees with you, this if it agrees with you, that if it agrees with you. What I'm saying is if your immune system doesn't react to it, which the less healthy we are, the more likely it is. If you can find any protein source that your immune system has zero reaction to, you might be better off only eating that one because it's so important to not be consistently eating food that your immune system is reacted to. We cover that in great detail in Feel Younger Diet Part 1. All right, let's move on to carbohydrates. The problem with carbohydrates is not that your immune system reacts to them. The problem with the carbohydrates is that and the fibers that usually come with them, because again, wherever you have simple um, conglomerations of carbs, you probably also have complex conglomerations of carbs in the natural world, known as fibers. It's what 
organism side you they feed and what impact that has on your health and maybe even your immune system. So very simply, the wrong kind of carb might feed the wrong organism in you, which will then allow them to, you know, maybe they're okay if they're in a minimal amount, like these are known as menstrual bacteria and then most of the bacteria in your gut. But once they start getting out of control, once they start to become too many of them, then they're classified as pathogenic, then they create a problem. That can cause an immune response in you. So that's why in terms of symptoms, it can be the same. Eating the wrong carb can give you all the same symptoms as eating the wrong protein because both of them trigger an immune response, but they trigger it in a different way. In the case of the protein, the immune response is to the protein itself. In the case of carbs, the immune response is to the organism that is feeding on that carb. That's the, the you know, the distinction there. So just... And those, those, those bacteria, those, those things in your gut are then potentially creating these endotoxins or things that our body is responding to that is causing not great things. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. I'm glad you brought that up because yes, there is more to it than only the immune response. There is also absolutely all the waste byproducts that they create, um, which are poisoning you. And as you say, endotoxin is, you know, one of the things that's going to prematurely age you and is prematurely aging most people. I like Ray Pete's work here because he points out that while it may be normal to have a significant amount of endotoxin being created in the average gut, it's still not good, just like it's normal to have a certain amount of heavy metal in every meal, but it's still not good, right? So as much as we can minimize that, the better. Now, Pete's approach was, you know, he liked certain, he preferred fruits generally, and he really liked oranges and all the rest of it. But he also taught, as far as I'm aware, uh, you need to you know, perceive, think, act. You need to pay attention to your own body and really look at what's happening. And that's why your question earlier was a good one, even though I didn't answer it in detail. Like, how do I know if my body's having a negative reaction? Again, if we talk about that, it's going to be too much long of an episode. So we have talked about that in other episodes. But um, yeah, you need to be watching what your body's response is. And just like with protein, if if just beef agrees with you or just egg whites agrees with you or just uh, uh, beans agrees with you or whatever it might be for you, that's great. As long as you're having one source of protein that actually agrees with you, that you're not having any negative reaction to, that's great. And it's kind of the same thing with carbohydrates. So if uh, starches agree with you, great. If uh, fructose agrees with you, great. If complex sugars agree with you, then great-ish, although it's quite hard to get enough of those. So that's still not, you know, great. And then um, if... Uh, like a, a refined sugar, like a sucrose agrees with you, then also, you know, potentially great. Although then that's a refined sugar, so you need to make sure you have more nutrients to go along with it. So really, even though I've made it seem complicated, but if we're talking about a bulk of calories, if we're talking about getting enough carbs, if we're talking about not starving ourselves of carbs, again, we might do that temporarily for a specific reason. Um, but most of us, unless we have that hunter-gatherer gene, um, definitely, and maybe even if we do have the country together regime, we need some carbs. How do we know if you need carbs or not? Here's the clue. It goes back to your first question, which was great, Chrissy. How do I know if I'm satiated? If you start craving carbs, your body needs carbs. This is not carbohydrates. Like um, Dr. Smith said this recently, and I agree. It's like there's no such thing as a ketone deficiency. Like if you don't have any ketones, you're fine. If you don't have any glucose, you drop dead. Like carbs are essential. Ketones may be good for a period of time. It's very good that our body has that backup system because it allows us to survive in all kinds of adverse conditions. But my objection to it is that in order to live with a zero or very low carb diet, we have to have high stress chemicals. We have to have high cortisol and adrenaline to uh, do gluconeogenesis and lipolysis and all the things that we do to, to create that backup. Now, I'm not against ketones, and we'll talk about that when we get to fats. I'm actually a big fan of having a lot of ketones every day. Um, but I'm just saying we also need carbs, most of us, most of the time. But what kind of carbs? And what about if they all disagree with us, right? So if every type of carb disagrees with you, does it make sense to just eat like a carnivore diet or a keto diet for the rest of your life? It may do. It may be the best option that you found so far, but I would suggest it would also 
make sense to try and work out why you cannot consume any carbohydrates now right because because just going to eating a purely carnivore diet does not get to the, the root cause underneath of why your body's not able to process it or it doesn't respond well no and I, I do think that there are some people who may actually you know be genetically pre kind of determined that they do thrive on a mostly meat diet i'm not against that but you can see even you know the top carnivores who five years ago were on joe rogan or whatever like most of them have started eating some carbs now and i don't knock them for that i think it's it's actually you know i'm glad that they're listening to their body and i'm glad that they you know had the courage to tell people that they made that change because yeah it, it does make sense your body needs some carbs it's it's really as simple as that long term usually although there are always exceptions um but yeah, to go back to your point about the root cause, yes. So if your body can't handle any kind of carbohydrate without feeling significantly worse, it is an indicator probably that there is some kind of dysbiosis in your gut. This is not unusual. This is not, this is not really a medical condition, although of course it can become one. It is just no, it's normal to have some degree of dysfunction, unfortunately. Um, but if it's at the level where it causes so much issue that you feel better without any carbohydrate. Now, again, if you're genetically predisposed to be a hunter-gatherer type, then overall you may weigh up all the factors and go, oh, I'll just, I just won't eat carbs. And maybe that's okay. Um, but an ideal situation would be maybe you still don't eat a lot of carbs. Maybe you never eat simple carbs if you are a hunter-gatherer type because, you know, that's not good for your blood sugar. Um, but maybe to, you know, optimize and work out what's going on maybe to do a full uh you know stall panel test and all the rest of it and find out what dysbiosis is going on and a SIBO test and uh candida test and whatnot like check all the things that it could be um and attempt to resolve it and i realize it's not easy i've talked about it in previous episodes i'm going to get experts on because i know it's not always easy but a lot of the times it actually is easy um a lot of time people are struggling for years with these issues and they could just go and do a simple protocol not always sometimes it's very difficult i know sometimes people in the comments are talking about how they've tried all the stuff i've recommended and it hasn't worked and i i recognize that too but anyway um so let's assume that you can tolerate any carbs what type of carbs are recommended on the feel younger diet so first of all Maybe surprisingly, I'm not as uh, averse to refined carbs as you may think. Um, a lot of the time, but not always, it is actually the fibers that really feed these bacterias that come with the carbs, not the carbs themselves. Um, so that's like the famous FODMAPs, which often are recommended. So um they are they're not all fibers but they're they're kind of they're more complex carbs more along the way to fiber so basically when it comes to a dysbiotic pathogenic overgrowth of the um of the gut of the small intestine specifically uh antibiotics whether pharmaceutical or herbal have around a 50 percent effectiveness rate for permanently resolving an issue like that while going on what is called an elemental diet which is where you only consume the nutrients in the most refined form possible with basically zero fiber because they do feed these organisms actually has an 80% success rate of permanently resolving these kind of issues. So this is not something I recommend to anyone because it needs to be done in medical supervision. This is definitely not a good idea to do long term for anyone uh, under any kind of supervision. But just the idea that... Um, Refined carbs are always bad, I think is simplistic when you consider like the facts that I just said as one example. Um, so sometimes having a more refined source. So what do I mean? I mean, like, for instance, I'm not talking about necessarily just eating tablespoons of white sugar, but like, for instance, uh, a freshly squeezed and filtered maybe to get rid of any pulp fruit juice. Maybe something that's a good idea for you. Um, maybe it's apple like, you know, Dr. Smith recommends, maybe it's orange, like Dr. Pete recommended, um, maybe it's something else, I don't know, but that's one option. Of course, all of those are still pretty high in fructose, especially apples. Apples are one of the highest fructose of all the fruits. Um, so that may not work for you, but it may if you get rid of all the fiber. So that's one option. Some people like bananas, they still have fiber, um, but they're a bit more starchy um, and you know, they're very low in anti-nutrients. 
Um, often the types of fruit that are considered to be the most beneficial, like the berries, actually have more of the complex carbs. So yes, they don't spike your blood sugar as much, but they may also irritate your gut more. That kind of depends. Yeah, those berries, they're, they, I think they do have a lot of fiber. Uh, they definitely have fiber and they have like the more complicated, the, the you know, the mannitol and the um, mannose and the, uh, the some of the sugar uh, xylitol, all those things that can potentially, you know, feed bacteria and, and cause digestive di distress. Um, and then they have the seeds as well, which IBD people, colitis people kind of have them because the seeds irritate their gut. Like there's lots of things potentially. Um, so another option is starch. Now, again, if you're talking about starch, ironically, often... The simplest starches may be a good starting point. So meaning rather than your quinoa, which is like full of, again, fiber, um, maybe going for white rice would be a good idea. Some people do very well with that. Uh, some people do well with oats. Some people do well with, uh, you know, millet or sorghum or cassava, which is technically a root, but is often treated as a grain because you can make flour of it and make cakes and bread and whatever. Um so maybe that would work. I would say, you know, you just got to, as long as you can find one that works for you, then you're sorted. Obviously, you ideally you'll find more than one because then uh, you can have more variety in your diet. Um, but as long as you, it's, it's better to have, it would be better to have only one type of carb that produces zero negative reaction than a selection where you have some reaction. That's always the rule that I tried to explain in part one of the Phil Younger diet of always, you know, removing the stuff that gives you a reaction. Um, now, you may say that, isn't that just like the carnivore diet where it's avoiding the problem? No, because first of all, it gives your immune system a chance to calm down if you stop giving it stuff it's reacting to. Second of all, it gives those bad bacteria a chance to die out if you stop feeding them. And third of all, it gives your gut to recover if you don't keep irritating it with your immune system overacting and your pathogenic bacteria being fed and flooding your system with toxins. So it absolutely is beneficial to, um, now, as, as I said, like an elemental diet, that's not something you do long term, but a diet where you only have, you know, beef and rice, for instance, uh, or beef and oats or beef and beans to go back to that example earlier or eggs and rice or eggs and beans or whatever um that's something that you actually could do long term and a lot of people do do long term and they actually do better than most people like is it completely nutritionally complete maybe not we'll talk about that but it actually might be pretty nutritionally complete compared to what most people eat so that's not necessarily such a bad option anyway um so so fruit is one option and then starch is really the other so i gave rice as an example uh, I gave other grains as an example. I gave beans as an example, though I talked earlier about why I wouldn't start with that. Uh, now, I'll end with my favorite option, which is root vegetables. I personally prefer root vegetables. Um, and out of all the root vegetables, I actually agree with Dr. Pete about this one as well. I love the humble white potato. The very thing that you're told is like the least beneficial. Um, why do I prefer out of all the root vegetables? Uh, because a lot of the other root vegetables have high levels of vitamin A whether it's your pumpkin, whether it's your sweet potato, whether it's your carrot, all of those are good options. Um, I'll just speak for me. Every time I've tested my vitamin A, it's been above the reference range. So I feel very comfortable that I would like to restrict my vitamin A. I noticed after six months of having the lowest possible vitamin A diet, my vitamin A levels were still above the reference range. So I feel comfortable restricting it. If yours are below the reference range, then you might want to do some serious thinking about whether you maybe you want to have some vitamin A after all. I, I'm not going to tell you what to do in that regard. I'm saying for me, it's an easy choice. I just won't have it because I already have too much. Um, so that's why I restrict it personally. But again, any type of root vegetable that agrees with you, that's my favorite. Now, just because that's my favorite doesn't mean it should be yours. If you prefer white rice, go for it. If you prefer orange juice or apple juice, go for it, right? But generally, if you have any kind of digestive issues, to minimize that fiber temporarily can be a good idea. What about if you're one of those uh, unique ascended um, people who have no digestive issues, genuinely? Not just that you don't notice any digestive issues, but you also don't have immune system issues, you don't have allergies, you don't have intolerances, you don't have chronic infections, you don't have headaches, you don't have joint pain, you don't have fatigue, you don't have any of that stuff. Okay, then lots of variety of fiber. 
is probably going to be best because it gives like the most different you know forms of foods to different uh, organisms inside you so you have a good variety i know what i'm saying is a bit controversial but it's the conclusion that I've ultimately come to. Some people who seek to heal gut health, they go the opposite direction. They try and recommend more high fiber foods, as many fibers as possible. The evidence for that, for me, is less and less compelling. There's more and more people curing themselves by either going on a zero fiber diet, like, a, like an obviously zero, like a carnivore or whatever, or by doing the kind of diet that I'm talking about now, where you still do get plenty of carbs, but you're just not having a lot of very complex carbs and you know not a lot of fiber and feeling a lot better on that. Obviously, if you're doing great on a high fiber diet, then carry on having a high fiber diet. Yeah, I think what I'm really hearing is, again, going back if it works for you and finding it. Because what you do know, and especially from Dr. Smith and what I've learned from you and you know bile and all of that, is that high fiber is going to especially draw out that bile. And if it's super toxic, then there's other issues too. And then we, we tend to, if it's too much, you know, and we're not pacing it correctly, then you know we can feel a lot worse than we should. So there's, there's, there's things to consider. That's the other factor. So the biggest genuine defense of having more fiber that I've heard is the one you just said, that it mops up toxic bile. And so that's why I say, and I'm not saying it flippantly, if it agrees with you, if, you, if you're sure it agrees with you, then definitely have fiber. But I've just noticed a lot of time it doesn't, it makes people feel worse. I don't believe that the reason for that is because it increases bile production. I haven't seen evidence of that. I've absolutely seen evidence that increasing your fat intake will increase bile production and release. I've seen, because, you know, it's pretty proven, I've seen evidence that having more um, acidic foods will increase the bile production. I've seen evidence that more bitter foods will increase bile production. Um, I've seen evidence that more animal protein will increase bile production. I don't see it for soluble fiber, but I do see the evidence that soluble fiber absolutely helps to mop up that bile and stop it being reabsorbed. So it definitely has that purpose. But I would say... If you're in that quite precarious position and you do notice that fibers disagree with you, you might be better going down the path of using other binders to stop that bar being reabsorbed that are not fibers and that are actually better as binders than fibers. So activated charcoal I've talked about before, clay I've talked about before, cholestyramine is a prescription only usually but it's like the gold standard that medical professionals will use to stop bile being reabsorbed um so that's potentially another option and obviously not all fibers are the same some people are fine with pectin but not uh you know guar gum or whatever so some people there are, there are a few fibers that are the least likely to be reactive with people um i think um sun fiber which is partially hydrolyzed guar gum is one of them i think uh modified citrus pectin is another one and i think acacia fiber is another one so those are three fibers that if you want to try some fiber for that purpose the problem with fiber in natural food unfortunately is there's loads of different types and it's more likely that one of them is feeding something that is causing a problem for you um a good book on like the case against fiber that I think I've mentioned before is called the fiber menace. And I'm not saying it's 100% right. It basically makes it sound like fiber is zero benefit and 100% detriment. But I just like to hear both sides of the argument. And I'm sure you've already heard the fiber is good argument your whole life. It's interesting to hear the other side. And of course, some of the carnivore influencers talk about this as well, how you know fiber has a lot of downsides in a lot of people. Um, again, just like we said with carbs, Maybe it only has downsides because you don't have a perfect intestinal environment. I'm not contesting that, but I'm saying in order to get to a perfect intestinal environment, sometimes you have to stop feeding those organisms at least temporarily. And so that may be a reason why you would like reduce that fiber. So getting carbs from simple sources. There's other reasons why you might want to go for say white rice over brown rice. So, um, or, you know, whatever equivalent to that. So the, the brown part is where, first of all, the unsaturated fat is. So rice oil is, you know, full of omega sixes. Um, the brown part is also uh, the most like where most of the anti nutrients are, like the lectins. Um, it's obviously where the fibers are, like we've talked about. Um, it's also um, most likely to be rancid. Uh, that part of it because of the oil content. So there are other reasons why you might want to go for a white 
as opposed to a brown version of you know wheat or rice or whatever it might be other than just fiber as well so to go back to carbs you know fruit if it agrees with you maybe avoiding the fiber to begin with if you have digestive or other issues um, starch if it agrees with you either grains or uh, root vegetables that would be really how I would break it down. We're gonna take a quick break to share with you one of our amazing sponsors, Genetic Insights. What makes Genetic Insights uniquely valuable is that they test over 83 million different variants, which guarantees a 99.7% accuracy on all of their DNA reports. With over 100 reports available, you get comprehensive insights into what your DNA is telling you about how to optimize your health today and in the future. I found reviewing my results to be incredibly accurate and applying some of the recommendations which are personalized to your individual DNA to be extremely helpful for me and my family. I also loved how easy it was to upload my raw DNA data that I already had from previously using Ancestry.com because Genetic Insights supports uploading raw data from all major platforms. To get your health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and get 20% off today by using coupon code rejuvenate. Remember that supporting our sponsors supports our podcast, which allows us to keep sharing this important information with you free of cost. So go get your Genetic Insights health reports by going to geneticinsights.co and use coupon code rejuvenate for 20% off today. Wonderful. So a lot, a lot to consider there. And I think it's still always coming back to that saying, if it agrees with you. Mm -hmm. So really paying attention there, finding that out and feeling what you feel with it. Beautiful. So the next category of macros that we're going to do our deep dive into, fats. So with fats, Owen, I know we've talked a little bit about it with uh, within the context of the proteins and a little bit with the carbs, but um, you know, it's it's been around for a very, very long time. So, so yeah, let's dive in. Yeah, let's do fats. I didn't, uh, the one thing I didn't do with carbs like I did with protein is a percentage. So we talked about 15 to 30 with protein, probably closer to 20 for the average person. Um, with carbs, obviously it depends a lot, as we talked about with genetics. Um, I would say probably a minimum would be 20 and a maximum would probably be 60. So that's, a, you know, it's a pretty big range, but it depends on those factors we talked about. And probably more, um, more on the higher end, if it agrees with you, is probably better because it is a bit more of a challenge for your body to turn fat into ATP than carbs overall. But of course, if it doesn't agree with you, of course, if you're not genetically inclined to break it down as well, then you got to do what you got to do. Beautiful. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Okay, so fats. So I guess there's no mystery as the percentage then for the mathematicians listening. Um, if we talked about maybe 20 protein and uh, 20 to 60 carbs, then yeah, when we're talking about fat that's left over, we're talking again, uh, 20 to 60, but probably, you know, like 30 to 40, I would say. And it's very easy to get that much fat. So as we talked about, um, the easiest thing to have too much of is fat. And the easiest thing to have too little of is protein, uh, unless you eat a lot of meat, the lean meat even. So, uh, okay, so fat. So fat in a way is simpler. So fat doesn't feed any organisms and fat doesn't create an immune response. Wonderful. So no problem with fat, right? Well, the biggest issue with fat is its degree of saturation. That's really the thing that we're looking for. And... It used to be believed maybe 40 years ago that unsaturated is good and essential even. That's the omega 3s and the omega 6 being essential. Saturated is bad. Saturated leads to clogged arteries and heart attacks. These days, we've almost got an inversion of that, at least in the part of the world that I live in, um, metaphorically, which is the belief that it's the opposite, right? Seed oils are bad. Omega 6s are bad. Omega 3s are a bit more contested, but certainly, but omega 6s are bad. And then like saturated fats, coconut oil is good. Everyone's talking about these days, coconut oil. If you feed soy oil to, you know, cattle, then they become like overweight and unhealthy. If you feed coconut oil, then they become slim and muscular. There's all these kind of stories. I'm sure you've heard that before, Chrissy. So is it as simple as that? Uh, not quite is the answer. So yes, it is true that the more unsaturated a fat is, the more easily it is oxidized. 
the more easily it is damaged by light and heat. That is a fact. So the only question is, are the mitigating factors that might mean that you still might prefer it? But it is a fact that an unsaturated fat is more easily damaged. So certainly when we're talking about processed oils in a jar or a bottle or whatever, given how long it's likely to have sat on a shelf and how much processing is likely to have gone for gone through, no matter what the manufacturers are claiming, it really doesn't make sense to me to be using unsaturated oils, except for in a very specific cases. An example of a very specific case, maybe black cumin seed oil. In that case, you know, it's known to have a lot of medicinal benefits. You might want to have a little bit of that every day, not for the oil, but because of the other stuff that's in there. Fair enough, okay? Again, no rules are, you know, 100%. But otherwise, um, and yeah, obviously keeping it in a dark place helps and keeping it, um, you know, in the fridge helps or even the freezer and all that kind of stuff. But still, it, just the process of extracting it is going to have damaged it a lot and make it a problem. Um, I suppose I'll just quickly review what's the problem with, uh, you know, more unsaturated fats, especially uh, omega-6s. Um Fundamentally, they slow down metabolism. That's the main issue with them. Um, the animals that tend to be high in them uh, naturally, which is fish, um, they have you know slow metabolisms. They're cold water creatures, right? They're not hot blooded uh, mammals. Um, generally, the fats that naturally grow in the most tropical, nearest the equator locations are saturated. The fats that grow naturally in the most um, polar areas are unsaturated fats. Simple theory behind this is if you are near the poles, there's probably not a lot of food, you need to slow down your metabolism. If you're near the equator, there probably is plenty of food, you can speed up your metabolism. So there's like a, you know, a simple logic to why that is. And I've heard, though I haven't actually verified this, that if you take the same plant and grow it in like North Norway, and grow it in uh, the Caribbean, it will have a different level of saturated and unsaturated fat. It's not only based on what the plant is, it is also based on where it grows. The more, yeah, the more warm it is, the more saturated the fat will be, is my understanding. To some degree, obviously, it is some, to some significant degree down to the uh, genetics of the plant as well. So that's a significant factor. Um, some people, though, genetically do not do as well with saturated fat, despite everything that I just said. It's more of a challenge for them. How do you know that? That's something you've got to get your genetics done for. There's neither here nor there. So, you know, we have a dietary fat report, first of all, that says how well does your body deal with fat in general? And then we have a saturated fat report, which is how well does your body do with saturated fat specifically? And I think we also have an unsaturated fat report. Um, I didn't check this beforehand, but I'm pretty sure that again tells you how well that you do with those. It's not a question of you're either one or the other. Some people do well with all three of what I just said. Some people do well with none of them. Um, unfortunately, that's the way life is in reality. It's not like, you know, you're this type or that type. It's not neat little boxes. Um, my fear in this, and we don't have time to talk about this today, I can tell, but we'll do this in a future episode, um, is that some people are going to be much better at dealing with fat um, for various reasons, which I won't go into now. So just I explained why about carbs, because that's quite simple to explain. The fat one is going to take a bit longer to explain. So I have to save that for the next episode. Um, but yeah, it's certainly, you know, it's my theory as to why is... Um, will take a while to explain, but the fact is indisputed and that's why we have a genetic report about it. Some people do better with fat than others. And so, as I said, unfortunately, it's not as simple as, oh, I'm the um, hunter-gatherer type, meaning I don't do well with carbs, therefore I must do well with fat. Unfortunately not. I wish that were the case. And it's not as simple as the other way around where, oh, I'm the farmer type, I do well with carbs, therefore I don't do well with fat. No, it's not as simple as that either. Some people are just lucky and they do very well with all macro sources. Some people are very unlucky and they do not well with any of them. Um, so that's something that, you know, we have to work out. So having said all that, there are reasons, but all things being equal, you want to go as unsaturated as possible. So those like you and I know you have these genetics, Chrissy, where saturated fat in large quantities does not agree with you, you have a couple of options. 
One option is to go for monounsaturated. And this is what a lot of cultures actually do. Uh, you know, famously, like the Mediterranean diet is supposed to be healthy, right? There's like the Sardinia is one of the blue zones. And so the idea of this is um, olive oil, basically, right? That's one of the primary uh, monounsaturated. Avocado oil, not Mediterranean, but that would be another source of, uh, you know, genuinely primarily monounsaturated fat. I used to think sesame oil is quite unsaturated and it is compared to most seeds, but it's still got quite a lot of omega-6s. So I'd put that quite far down the list. It's, you know, avocado and olive are the main ones that I can really think of that are mainly monounsaturated, high in, uh, you know, oleic acid specifically. Oh, yeah, I mean, the other exception to that would be seeds that have been um, hybridized to be that way. So there is something called high oleic sunflower oil which has been uh, bred to be much more monounsaturated fat. And so that would be another option uh, potentially as well. So I don't know if there's high oleic other stuff like canola or whatever, but if there is, I guess that's another option. As long as you're happy that it's organic or whatever well-sourced, then it at least doesn't have that problem of being polyunsaturated, which is the type of fat that is very uh, easily oxidized and therefore very bad potentially for your health for all the reasons we talked about in other episodes. Um, so that's the theory. Let's get into the practice. Um, where does fats come from? So we talked about this already. So we'll just re recap. It comes from uh, land animals, mammals. Um, it comes from fish. It comes from nuts and seeds. And it comes from dairy and it comes from eggs. Those are the main sources of dietary fat. So Dairy, you're talking about exclusively saturated fat, pretty much. If saturated fat agrees with you, great. And you should always have full fat dairy, in my opinion, um, unless fat or saturated fat really doesn't agree with you. Because overall, it's better to have things in the kind of proportions that they are in nature. Um, with uh, land animals, it kind of depends. We talked about this already. Your ruminants, your grass eaters, is primarily saturated. If they're eating more, you know, nut uh, uh, seeds and soybeans and stuff like that, then they're going to have more unsaturated fats. So your pigs, your, your poultry, more unsaturated. Are they still some saturated? And then your your grass eaters, primarily saturated. So again, um, because you know they're not feeding olives to any kind of chickens or pigs, um, we're really talking about either the bad fat or the saturated fat. If you don't do well with either, you might not want a large amount of fat from either of those sources, you know, potentially. If you're going to eat those animals, which you may well do for protein's sake, then you'd have the lean version, right? If that makes sense. Um, with, so we talked about, you know, the, the fish, right? So if you fish, they are going to be high in unsaturated fat. Um, very high in long chain omega free unsaturated fat, which is supposed to be one of the benefits also quite high in another type of form of fat called odd chain fatty acids, which are very interested, uh, which I'm very interested in. I don't feel like I know enough about them yet to uh, talk with any authority. But what I have seen, um, they have a lot of interesting health benefits. They are particularly high in dairy fat and in fish fat. And so there's some speculation that Maybe some of the benefits of eating fish that have been found, they're not really replicated by eating like omega-free supplements, might be actually the odd chain fatty acids in the fish that make fish beneficial despite the high level of unsaturated fat that is all, almost that is in there. Instead of because of the unsaturated fat, it might be despite it. It might be these odd chain fatty acids. They have a lot of beneficial qualities, but as to whether they really outweigh anything, as I said, I don't have any authority on that yet. Um, so that's like, you know, potentially interesting. But anyway, so um, omega free fatty acids, that's the main place you're going to get them. Are omega free fatty acids good? We've talked about this previously in different episodes, I'll refer you to those. Um, but if you're looking to get them, then I would recommend getting them from fish. Um, most of as I just said, most of the research showing the benefits of omega free are fish source not flaxseed or hemp seed source, not um, uh, like fish supplement source, fish oil supplement source, to be honest, even though I know we sell them and feel younger because there is evidence behind them, but fish, there's more evidence behind fish and we don't sell fish. <laughs> so ultimately, we're talking about diet, we're talking about fish. 
Um, so if you want to go for that um, as a fat source, that that would be the best fish. Um, if you want to, you know, have omega three, and um, what are the other ones? So yeah, next we've got nuts and seeds. As I said, other than macadamia or coconut, I would not use these as a fat source. If you enjoy, you know, almonds or pistachios or whatever, fine, but I would not make them a staple for anything. I would have them be a treat. Um, in terms of uh, eggs, that would be the other one, egg yolks. We talked about whites. If they agree with you, egg yolks, if they agree with you. Egg yolks are a tricky one. They have high levels of choline, and they're one of the only foods that's high in choline. And so for me, it's a bit of a um, a bit of a risk reward equation. Now, what do I think is bad about yolks? Not the saturated fat. That's fine. Not the cholesterol. That's fine. Not any of the things that people say are bad. But I'm more concerned about the you know very high levels of retinol for me. Now I'm someone. Yeah, I was going to ask. I was going to say because I mean I do love a good egg yolk. <laughs> But for all the things that we've been learning and discovering, then it's like, mm, yeah. So I'd love to hear your points on this. Yeah, for me, because I definitely have too much vit vitamin A in my blood and I definitely um, do not make enough choline. I'm definitely deficient in choline. I prefer to supplement choline rather than eating eggs. And also I don't like eggs. I hate eggs, actually. Now, if I loved eggs and I was deficient in choline, and I wasn't that bothered about my vitamin A. I don't really eat it anywhere else. It's not very high in my blood. I don't think I have the symptoms of vitamin A toxicity. I probably feel fine eating egg yolks, honestly. So I think it's a bit of a judgment call, depending on like factors like that. Um, I'm, I'm acting like choline is the only nutrient in there. No, there's actually loads of nutrients in egg yolks. It's just that choline is the only one that is in almost nothing else. That's why I'm highlighting it. <laughs> yeah, because I know in my genetic reports, I have a, more of a need for choline as well, too. Yeah. So, you know, fair enough, Christy. I don't know if you've ever tested your vitamin A. Um, it's not that expensive. I think it's like $40 or something like that. So you could always do that to, you know, reassure yourself. Um, I was above the range, but most people I've seen are not. So um, <laughs> I know Dr. Smith would disagree with that. He would say um, that, you know, it's potentially very misleading. But I would say if you are mid, you know, mid range or below, and you are doing a lot of detoxification efforts, so let's say you sauna frequently, you exercise a lot, you go in the sun, um, you do breathing practices, you take niacin, um, you know, you do all these things that would cause uh, toxins to leave storage, and then you test, and you're still not high. I'd say that actually is a fairly good indication that you probably don't have very high stores of it. Um, you know, just like uh, with Copper, we ascertained with me when I did the interview with him recently that um, given everything, I probably don't have high storage of Copper. I just have no sign of it. So I, I think that's a reasonable bet in that case if you're doing a lot of things that would cause cellular detoxification and you still don't have high vitamin A in your blood, I would say. I'd feel reasonably confident it's okay to have egg yolks and stuff like that and it's no big deal. Um, I, but I say egg yolks and stuff like that. I'd kind of limit it to egg yolks. You know, the only thing that I have that has vitamin A in is dairy. If I were having a lot of egg yolks, I probably wouldn't have dairy as well. You know, that's like a choice. I, I would pick my poison in that regard, as it were. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that's my opinion on egg yolks. Maybe beneficial, maybe not. Um, maybe a good source of fat because of the other nutrients that are in there, maybe not. Um, so... We talked earlier about, you know, what of saturated fats aren't good for you. So one exception is, uh, oh, fruits we haven't talked about. So free oils are the monounsaturated ones. Olives are a fruit. Avocados are a fruit, right? Durian is a fruit, although I've never seen durian oil for sale. Um, but that is another high fatty fruit that actually, when you're in Southeast Asia, I find delicious. Um, but uh, so, so, yeah, monounsaturated fats are usually fruit oils, actually, ironically. Um, so if you, saturated fat doesn't agree with you, if saturated fat agrees with you, it's kind of easy. You can just go back to beef, like we've talked about, maybe eggs, maybe dairy, you know, pretty simple. Um, if it doesn't agree with you, another option, this is something I do as well, is to go for coconut oil, but specifically, uh, MCT oil, specifically, specifically C8 MCT oil. That's the type I use, which is caprylic acid. 
So this has quite a few benefits. Um, first of all, caprylic acid is something I heard about a long time ago before anyone talks about uh, MCT oil because it's one of the things that's used as a candida killer in candida killing supplements. So it used to be like, you know, 250 milligrams or 500 milligrams in a capsule used to be sold as a candida killer. Now I'm taking like a tablespoon of the stuff at the time. Like that's got to be pretty good in the sense of preventing overgrowth of yeast because with bacteria, you want some, so it's trickier. That's why we spent ages talking about it with carbohydrates and fiber and all this. With yeast, it's pretty simple. You just don't want it in your intestine in any significant quantities. So to keep that knocked back with something as innocuous and uh, non-toxic as MCT oil, I think is quite smart. Second of all, all the kind of keto people have a point that ketones are an excellent source of energy for certain parts of the body, including specifically the brain. And so to give your body a like very um, easily absorbed quick form of brain energy and organ energy in the in the form of uh, you know this easily utilized um, MCT uh, type of um, uh, fat I think is a good idea. Uh, third of all, MCT oil, unlike every other type of fat, doesn't need processing by the liver. So there's always exceptions. We talked about like no carbs need processing by the liver except fructose. Well, all fats need processing by the liver except MCT oil. So if you don't want to overburn your liver anymore, maybe you already drink alcohol, maybe you already do this, maybe you already do that, then one thing you can do is to have a higher proportion of fat come from MCT oil. So I can tell you for myself, and again, just because I do it doesn't mean it's a good idea for you, but for myself, around half of my fat intake comes from saturated fat, um, and half of it comes from MCT oil. And I like I like it that way. I think that's very good. Um, it it kind of gives me the best of both worlds. It gives me not having the burden of um, having a lot of fat on my liver, but still having the benefit of the quick energy without spiking blood sugar at all from the uh, MCT oil. Plus it gives me the, you know, suppressing any kind of yeast, which is very effective in my uh, testing experience. Since I've been doing it, I've tested Candida several times and it's come up as, you know, non-existent um, in my uh, intestines. And so there are many other benefits from MCT oil. I'm sure you could Google like an article of top 10 benefits or whatever, but those are the, the things that I focus on. So I actually think that's a good source. Now, do I think it's a good idea to get a bottle, pour a tablespoon and shove it in your mouth? No. Often it has like a really weird aftertaste effect and it often causes digestive discomfort. But for whatever reason, and I saw Chris Masterjohn talk about this, so I know it's not just me, um, but this is my experience. If you add it to warm liquid, and in my opinion, especially if it is warm liquid, which is food, not just a cup of coffee, although plenty of people do that, then it, my body has zero digestive issues with it. Absolutely zero. Even when my digestion was really sensitive, there was no problem with it whatsoever. Uh, I'm not sure, um, but I, I know it works. So I put it in soup, but you could add it to stew, you could add it to curry, you could add it to, you know, any kind of, again, the sauce section from, uh, you know, a restaurant. And if all you're eating is steak and rice, as, you know, we talked about earlier, admittedly, this is going to be more of a challenge. Um, but with the rice, you know, if you if you uh, put the rice in like a bit of a broth, maybe, like a, a collagen peptides broth or a bone broth or whatever it might be, um, like a lot of uh, Asian people eat, food that way you know they have like a broth with white rice and, and meat in there or fish in there then that would be another way of doing it potentially so any kind of warm liquid um will work very well in my experience so i have three tablespoons a day of it usually which is 45 grams which is uh i think 400 calories something like that so it's maybe 15 to 20 percent of my yeah, probably 15% of my um, total calorie intake. So yeah, the, you know, fairly significant. And again, zero digestive distress if you do it that way, in my experience. Um, so that's a potentially great source. So zero stress on the liver, instant energy, doesn't spike blood sugar, doesn't lead to weight gain, increases metabolism, doesn't turn into body fat. There's a lot of benefits to that. Um, and then other than that, yeah, I would really go for either avocado or olive or their oils, if you are more of a saturated fat doesn't agree, or simply having the saturated fat that comes naturally 
with your animal food if you're having meat or dairy um, because it's always better to have it natural rather than refined in oil or if you're having plant food I personally would go for uh, coconut and macadamia with it. Great that's quite a comprehensive list and thank you for breaking it down so well in that because it's like you really think about the different choices okay yeah proteins carbs fats da 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 da. but you know with you going over everything and and speaking about it just kind of puts it more, um, yeah, just makes it a little bit more clear. Like, okay, these are really great sources, you know, because it's just, yeah, there's, there's a lot of, I should say, you know, uncertainty, unknowing out there. Like, even though it should seem like it's super simple, there's, it can be so confusing because there is just so much information. So, sorry, so much information and so many different things going, do it this way, do it that way. So thank you for going through that list. And I realize it's kind of tricky for me because first of all, I had a nutritional background going even to being a teenager as much as I was not healthy back then. I still, I did like a GCSE in nutrition and I was kind of into it. And and then I was a chef off and on for 10 years. So like, this is not a challenge to me and I realize it is more tricky for most people. So just to give a couple of examples, you know, like the, the way that the bodybuilders eat almost of like just white rice and chicken, that's perfectly acceptable. I would not have the chicken. I would have the uh, beef instead, as I said. But but that works. That's okay. What about what I just said? Well, ideally, you don't just have animal flesh. You also have some connective tissue because it's more balanced with the amino acids and stuff. Dr. Pete talked about that. And so ideally, you'd have some um, maybe like uh, pressure cook a... Uh, you know, like a, uh, a piece, a cut of the meat that maybe has a bone through it and stuff like that as well, so that, you know, you're having that rather than only the muscle, so you're having some, like, connective tissue. Or if you're lazy like me, you can just throw in some collagen peptides in some hot water um, or, uh, you know, something like that. And then you can, you know, put some some oil in there if you want to or you can just have fatty pieces of meat in there. Or, you know, you can do exactly what I just said, but the, you know, the fish version instead, you can buy fish collagen peptides and or you can cook the whole fish, including the bone and connective tissue and get the nutrients from there. Like, so just, and I, like, as I said, this is like a traditional Asian way of eating. People are like, well, what do I eat for breakfast then? The same thing. Like, the, 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 like it, it, I, I love traveling through Asia, not that I travel that extensively, but I went to a few countries and... Like to them, this idea that in breakfast you have to have this completely different thing that you have like for your lunch or dinner is like they had no idea what you're talking about. You know, they would just generally have rice, meat, egg, some vegetables. That's like what I saw over and over again. Yes, for breakfast as well as lunch as well as dinner. Um, again, some of them didn't didn't have the egg. Some of them had more fish. Some you know, but it was basically like some kind of animal protein and some kind of rice you know sometimes wheat noodles something like that and then some kind of um uh vegetable sometimes fermented sometimes not uh like it is really really simple so everything that i'm saying here over a billion people manage every day including people in extreme poverty this is not like uh, you know people who don't have a home a lot of the time that you know and you people are just living in shacks and stuff like that who are managing to prepare food in this way several times a day this is not the most difficult thing in the world i promise you the thing that makes it difficult is this belief that there has to be variety and the truth is yes we have the luxury of variety because we're not in that impoverished situation like some of the people i just mentioned but just because you can have something doesn't mean you should have something just because there's tinder these days doesn't mean you should be having sex with hundreds of thousands of people you know uh, just because there is um you know a million retail stores online doesn't mean you should be buying stuff from thousands of different places and having them shipped to your home you know just because you can anyway i could go on but you get the idea yeah, like i do just because you have the option of doing something doesn't mean it's a good idea maybe it is better to be you know monogamous maybe it is better to only buy things if you actually need them and maybe it is better to just choose like a staple maybe not just one thing as i said it could be root rotation one day your protein could be egg white one day your protein could be fish 
One day your protein could be uh, cheese. One day your protein could be uh, uh, beef, if, if all those things agree with you. One day it could be rice. One day it could be wheat noodles. One day it could be millet. One day it could be, you know, uh, teff and jero, if those things agree with you. I'm not saying it always has to be the same, but I'm saying, like, start with just working out what agrees with you. Have that be your staple. Have that be what you have every meal and wait until you actually feel good. And then make sure it's something you like as well, as we talked about, that you actually enjoy it. A lot of enjoying it, though, is just down to proper preparation. Like, if everything I just said sounds super boring and not enjoyable to you, you have to learn about FAS. So FAS is how chefs make things taste good, other than cheating with MSG. It stands for um, fat, acid, sorry, fat, fatty, acid, salt, and sweet. Anything pretty much can be made enjoyable if you understand that. Certainly any of the things I'm recommending. The number one thing is uh, salt. If you're not enjoying, most of what I've talked about is savory other than, you know, the fruit. If you're not enjoying it, you probably just aren't adding enough salt to it. First of all, salt is very beneficial. We talked about it in different episodes. Second of all, if you add enough to it, it will probably taste pretty good. Now, it's not necessarily enough. Sometimes it needs a little bit of acid. So that's where a little bit of lemon juice, a little bit of vinegar, especially if you're talking about a broth or anything like I was just talking about, will magically make it nicer. Fat, you know, we've really talked about. Um, and then, you know, sweet. Um, this is sometimes where, you know, like I spend a lot of time in Thailand, a lot of time when they're preparing food there in the way I just said, they will cheat with that a bit. They'll put a bit of sugar in there or something like that. Um, Sometimes, you know, like uh, the Indians, they'll put like raisins in their curry, you know, things like that. Sweet is kind of relative, though. The least sweet thing is just like carnivore, just eating a hunk of meat. Even just adding like white rice to it, although it's not sweet in the traditional sense, it will actually, you know, a lot of people who say they have carb cravings, they're actually perfectly satisfied by potato or bread or whatever. Like, so... Again, if you're eating the way that I'm recommending, which is not in this extreme way, where you are having a reasonable amount of most of the micro, well, of all the microbes in most cases, you'll actually be satisfying the fatty and the sweet. So then all it is really about is balancing the salt with the acid. If you just make sure that you have enough of each of those, it will be tasty. It will be good. The combination of salty plus fatty plus tasty plus carby, let's call it that, rather than sweet, tastes good. It tastes good than most salads or whatever, you know, thing that you maybe tried to eat in the past that, you know, you thought was helping you lose weight or be healthy or whatever it might be. So it's really not that difficult. With a bit of fat, with a bit of lemon juice and or um, vinegar. I don't do any, either of those things, by the way. If I, to add acid, I take a little bit of vitamin C powder and put it in. So then I'm also getting vitamin C because it's basically an acid. So, you know, that's by me. Uh, or, or sometimes something else, some of the nutrient. At the, most, at the moment I'm using, uh, what's it called? Pyroglutamic acid, which is a specific type of amino acid. But it's also sour. Uh, creatine. Uh, creatine, the most popular form of creatine is creatine monohydrate. But there's another form also sold, perfectly you know easy to get, called creatine hydrochloride. If you put creatine hydrochloride in, it will make it acid. So if you don't like vinegar or vitamin C, but you take creatine because you're trying to put on muscle or you've heard that it's good for methylation or whatever, even that will make it more acidic. Like there are loads of options, um, even in the realm of like health supplements, let alone in the in the culinary world. So it's really not that hard to make these things taste good, in my uh, opinion. It, it may be hard to get a piece of lettuce or broccoli to taste good, <laughs> but it's not hard to get this stuff to taste good. Oh, and this has been really great. A wonderful breakdown into the macros. I know we haven't even gotten into the micronutrients yet, so we're going to have to put that to a part two of this. But um, yeah, this has been wonderful and educational. And just also, too, just breaking it down into how simple this actually can be. So before we close, I do want to say, you know, do you have any other or do you have any final thoughts for our listeners today? Yeah, feel free to point out anything you think I've missed in the comments or if you disagree with me. Uh, I do check all the comments. Oh, this is talking about YouTube. You might be listening to it on somewhere else, but you can go to YouTube and um, check it out there and add, uh, you know, if you have questions, if you disagree, uh, let me know. I'm always interested in learning. I'm always open. Um, but to me, this is the approach that is 
the most practical. Now, in terms of the philosophy, if you think it's wrong, well, when some people are meant to be vegetarian, some people are meant to be carnivores, all this kind of stuff, I will get into that. We want to talk about that in a future episode. This is very much kind of aimed at the middle, um, where I'm trying to like give a, a way through for everyone, that, you know, irrespective of your genetic type, while acknowledging your genetic type and referencing it when appropriate. Um, but in terms of more the philosophical aspects, maybe even the moral aspects and stuff like that, I'm not ignoring that uh, forever. I'm ignoring it this episode because we're already over two hours. Um, but I will get into all that. So if you have opinions on that, feel free to add it because I may well uh, feel free to add it in the comments because I may well reference it in a future episode. Beautiful. And as always, thank you all for joining us. It's, you know, it's our pleasure to be here with you. And please do remember, if you're listening to this now, put uh, put something down in the comments, even if it's just a, you know, an emoji, a heart or something, just that also helps um, everybody know that you're here, that you like it and what and whatever's behind that algorithm or that system, it tells, it tells them and helps us. So please do that. And please make sure that you do hit that like and subscribe button and the bell icon so you don't miss an episode. And we'll see you next time. Hey, thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed that, I recommend watching our latest episode, which you can do by clicking above. And make sure to subscribe, like the video, comment and share with anyone who you think might appreciate it. Thank you.